Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is the last Tech Guy show. The show originally aired in the Premier Networks on Sunday, December 18th, 2022. Now, when I say last, I don't mean the last forever, just the last on the radio. We have a best of coming up. And then uh, starting January 8th, Micah Sargent and I will continue on this same channel. If you're already getting the podcasts, as you clearly are, keep subscribing. You'll keep getting it. Brand new show, Ask the Tech Guys. Not on the radio, just on the internet. Uh, it'll be a little different, a little bit more relaxed. I think a lot more fun. A lot of great content. So I hope you will continue to listen. But for now, to my radio audience, thank you. And so long. This is episode 19. 54. Enjoy. The Tech Guy Podcast has been brought to you all these years by Cashfly. Cashfly is the only CDN built for throughput, delivering rich media content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods and 30% faster than other major CDNs. Learn how you can get your first month free at cashfly.com. Thanks for listening to this show as an ad supported network. We are always looking for new partners with products and services that will benefit our qualified audience. Are you ready to grow your business? Reach out to advertise at twit.tv and launch your campaign now. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy for the very last time. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. I guess we're going to retire that. Rich says uh, Rich on Tech, his new show, which starts... Uh, January 7th, we'll have its own dedicated number. That's awesome. It'd be silly if he was using mine. <laughs> 88, 88 Ask Leo. Uh, the website will stay, will stay, yes, techguylabs.com. That will point, and has been pointing for most of the year, to uh, the podcast site where I will continue to labor during the day, my day job, uh, twit.tv. If you go to techguylabs.com, it will link to the new Ask the Tech Guys show that Micah Sargent and I will be uh, starting in the new year, January 8th. So really, you're, you're not going to lose anything. You're not, lo <laughs> you're not losing a tech guy. You're gaining a rich. So rich on tech on Saturdays, and I hope you'll join me on Sundays for the Ask the Tech Guys show. Meanwhile, 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number, 888-827-5536. No tearful farewells, please. Not necessary. I'm not going anywhere. Um, what's going on in the world? Wow, wow. Well, I guess. I guess. Did you watch Laura? Did you watch the uh, the World Cup final? Yes, I did. Okay, no spoilers. Um, was it exciting? Of course. You know, I'm watching uh, on Mastodon. I'm watching all the people. You know, cheering and you know, and I watched it. And I'm watching all the excitement. And I'm thinking, yeah, this is okay. This is okay. This is is not as exciting as not one but two of the football gridiron American football games from yesterday, which were really exciting. <laughs> so, you know, I guess different strokes. What can I say? Speaking of football, it looks like Apple, which was hot and heavy to acquire the NFL Sunday ticket from DirecTV, has backed out of the negotiations. This is a tech story because... DirecTV, which had it for, what, three, four years, was spending an outrageous billion and a half dollars for this NFL Sunday ticket, which I don't, I don't have DirecTV. I'm not sure, but I gather is like all the games on Sunday, right? Like, you know, because Sunday is a big day for NFL football. So all the games. Um, and, of course, DirecTV bought it because they thought it would drive subscriptions to DirecTV. Not just from us individuals, but from bars and restaurants and places that wanted to show football games. Um, but they were losing a lot of money, and it really it was an un <laughs> they couldn't justify it, so they gave it up. Starting uh, next year in 2023, Apple said, "Oh, we'll wait. yeah, we'll take it. How much? I don't know what the amount was, but uh, it doesn't really matter. Apple has a little bit of money." <laughs> they have a little bit of cash just lying in the drawer on the side. It's in the sock drawer on the left, uh, underneath the Argyles, right there. There's about, I don't know, $200 billion, I think it is, dollars, U.S., American, $200 billion, not even crypto, like real money. 
And uh, I think they probably said, hey, here, here, NFA, NFL, have $10 billion. Why not, right? They had bought the uh, rights for the next 10 years to Major League Soccer in the U.S. MLS, which probably didn't cost that much money. Uh, NFL football must have been more expensive, but I don't think that was the problem. I don't think it was about money. The NFL didn't want to give up control. And, of course, you know Apple. You know how Apple is about control. We want it all. Our way or the highway is their motto, their secret motto. But, uh, you know, they weren't so... I guess that's what where they came to loggerheads, as as <laughs> as the old folks say. They came to lo I don't even know what a loggerhead is, but they came to loggerheads, and uh, apparently, it's. I mean, still, this is all just sort of rumor from Dylan Byers at uh, Puck dot news, which is an excellent site, and Dylan's very connected, so I think he's probably accurate. The uh, problem was that the NFL, Apple, wanted to give it away. Apple wanted you just to be, oh, yeah, an Apple TV Plus subscriber? Great, you have NFL on Sunday. And the NFL said, what? You cr you can't do that. That'll devalue the games. It'll hurt ticket sales, whatever. I don't know. For, for some reason, they didn't want it. Now, just because Apple's out of the running doesn't mean like NBC, CBS, or anybody else is interested. They're not. Too expensive. You know, they like, yeah, we'll just take, a, you know, Amazon has the, I want the Thursday games just. Uh, you know, we'll just have those, you know. But uh, apparently, Amazon and Google are still in the running. What is what? Is, what is what are what are in common between Amazon, Google, and Apple? Well, they don't. They're not in the TV business exactly. They have TV, Amazon Prime, YouTube TV. They have that stuff, but they don't. It's not their primary business, is it? It's always good to remember what a company's primary business is. Google's primary business is ad advertising. You know, yeah, you might think they're a search engine, but really, they're only a search engine to the degree that they can sell advertising. At against the search results. Amazon, you might think, well, that's just a big store. It's a book it's a bookstore, right? No. <laughs> Amazon just wants a finger in every transaction in the entire world. Seriously, that's their that's their goal. And then uh, Apple, you'd think, well, that's the iPhone company. It is. But the problem for Apple is they don't know how long this nice iPhone business, this legacy business of the iPhone will last. So they want to add to, in fact, all three of them are trying to add to ARPU, I don't know what loggerheads is, but I know what ARPU is. Average revenue per user, A-R-P-U, which is the current, like the hot thing on Wall Street. ARPU. You got to have ARPU. And if you think about Apple, you know, they can only sell iPhones to so many people before everybody has an iPhone. But what they can increase is the average revenue per iPhone user. That's what they want to increase, the ARPU. How do you do that? By getting them to pay for services like Apple TV, right? Uh, oh, same thing for Google, same thing for Amazon. Increase the average revenue per user. Uh, and so the way you do that is with uh, candy. In this case, the candy, the tasty candy. We're not talking uh, candy corn here. No, we're talking the good stuff, the bonbons, the hot chocolates, uh, is football, NFL gridiron football. And uh, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Um I don't, I don't want to talk about Twitter. I don't like talking about Twitter, but I'm going to have to talk about Twitter just briefly. This will be a quickie. This will be a quickie. Elon is going out looking for new investors. <laughs> and uh, and all he's asking is $54.20 a share. You know, maybe that's why he was at the World Cup today, standing next to Jared Kushner, who has a couple of billion from the Saudis. Maybe that's why. Jared, Maybe Jared will kick in a little. You know, get by a couple of shares, Jared. Uh, he's got money. Uh <laughs> Looking, to, you know, I don't think, excuse me, Elon, but I don't think you're going to succeed with that. I don't think anybody would be crazy enough. The newest thing Twitter's doing is is blocking. You cannot in on Twitter put a link out or send a link to any competing social network, not Facebook, not Instagram, not not Mastodon. You can't you can't put a link into it. It's against their terms of service. You can't put a link to your Instagram account. Does it, I'm sorry, but I, I seems like that was a big part of what Twitter was all about. I think, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, virtual reality is going just great. Poor, poor Meta, <laughs> poor Mark Zuckerberg, put all his chips. He, he, you know, he had all his chips on social, and realized that wasn't going so great. 
So he's moved all his chips over. Uh, he put them all on red. The metaverse. Ten, he lost $10 million last year on the metaverse. Thousands of engineers working on the metaverse. And the guy leading the charge for meta was John Carmack, who was a legendary uh, programmer, game developer, and was at Oculus, where the technology that Meta uh, uses was started. And, of course, Meta bought it. And uh, and with, with buying it, they bought John Carmack, who is now gone. He's quitting. 52 years old. He's been criticizing Facebook. <laughs> he says... Uh, let me see. Meta, which is in the midst of transitioning from a social networking company to one focused on the immersive world of the metaverse, this is the New York Times writing, can you tell, was operating at, quote, half the effectiveness and, quote, has a ridiculous amount of people and resources, but we constantly self-sabotage and squander effort. It's been a struggle for me, says John Carmack. I have the, a voice at the highest levels here. I can, I can knock on Mark's door and say, Mark, you got a minute? I want to talk. He says, but it feels like I should be able to move things, but I'm evidently not persuasive enough. In other words, whatever, whatever, whatever reason, it's not going the way he wanted it to. So he's out of there. He's out of there. 8888 Ask Leo. I am out of here, but not for another three hours. So you call me <laughs> and let's talk tech. 888-827-5536. Website techguylabs.com. Sam Ebel, Sam Ed Car Guy coming up. Your call's next. What? A, where did you, where did you get that, Dan Mall? That's hysterical. I don't know if that even looks like me. Is that what I looked like back in the day, back in the, the old days? <laughs> I love that. I don't think I was. I ever on the Computer Chronicles? I don't think so. But if I was, I would have looked. Kind of like that. I don't. I don't remember ever being on the Computer Chronicles. Hello, Sam. Hello, Leo. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well. Speaking of stuff you were on before, yeah. This morning, my wife was saying, "So today's the last tech guy, right?" And I said, "Yep." And uh, she said, "When? When did you first see Leo, or you know, listen to Leo?" I said, well, actually, the first time was before I knew who Leo Laporte was. And I started telling her about Dev Null. Oh. And she didn't remember the site. Yeah. Um, and so I pulled up, I grabbed my phone and pulled up a clip on YouTube of uh, Dev Null talking with uh, Soledad O'Brien and showed it to her. And she got a good laugh. That was out of Leo? That. that guy? That jerk? Yeah. <laughs> oh my God! I I got from the producer of the site, uh, very kindly. He moved. He was moving out of his, uh, you know, palatial estate in Napa, uh, David Borman, and he's moving to uh, Palo Alto. And he said, "You know, I have this big, the original site sign, this big lit sign that hung over the set that we made at great expense for NBC. Would you like it?" And I said, "Yes, I would." So we have it. The problem uh, is. You know where to put it? <laughs> no, I have somewhere to put it. Uh, I'm going to hang it over the over my head, but uh, like a sort of damn. But it needs to be repaired quite. A, it's in kind oh. of it, it's kind of in a bad shape. It, it had fluorescent, specially made. The whole thing must have cost a hundred thousand dollars. I don't know whether it has specially made curved fluorescent tubes to light it from the inside, and uh, they were all sp kind of broken and smashed. Uh, oh, bummer. D David said. Oh, I think the ballast is gone. No, no, the tubes were smashed. So uh, just rip them out and put in some LED. That's exactly strips. what we. I was going to do anyway. So that's that's the process. Burke's in the process of doing that. And then the other problem is that uh, it's a big glass piece of glass that uh, had screws into it, and it was cracking the glass. So uh -huh. we have uh, we're going to figure out a way to Burke build is, a frame around it. Yeah, or something. Well, it has a frame around it, but uh, the frame is held in by the screws. Burke is nervous about drilling the glass, but I think he's going to have to do that. So, anyway, anywho, the site lives on. Yes. We will talk in a thanks, few. Thanks to YouTube. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Well, just a little bit of the site. Yeah. <laughs> David said he had, he has all of his, all of the 
the tapes of everything he's ever done, including the site. So, wow, somebody's got it. He he said, "Now you're only the sign is only on loan to you. I want it to go to the Computer History Museum when you're done with it." So, yeah, it's pretty heavy. Yeah, so it it will be uh -huh. a as long as they accept it, a, a exhibit. He says they have all his papers, so I guess they'll want it. No, Stanford has all his papers. Anyway, anyway. All right. Uh, all right I see you on the Mastodon. Don't put a link in your Twitter because... It's too late. It's already there. Yeah, mine is too. But I'm just it. waiting to see if he if they take me down because that's all I've got on Twitter now is yeah. a link to my Mastodon. I'm wondering uh, how long before they kick me off. I shouldn't say that out loud. I shouldn't say that out loud. <laughs> All right, we'll talk in a few. Thank you. All right. How many years have you been unbreakable, Kim Sheffer? How <laughs> did, long have did, you did fill in with Heather since 2013, early 2013. 2013? And early 2016, we started doing her Saturday meet That's Sunday. That's right. Yeah, I remember and that. And then in early 2017, I took she over faded the whole to thing. Black. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so you've been here 10 years almost. Almost. Yeah. It would have been in August <laughs> next nice. year. Nice. Yeah. Well, so I, I'm, I'm glad to, to hear that you will be continuing on with a new show. So that's that's great news. But I will miss you. I will miss you. This is Oh, you don't have fun. to lie. No, it's I'm okay. not lying. I'll it's miss you. Fun. Yeah. If, I, if I didn't like doing it, I would not give up every Yeah, because God knows they don't pay you much. <laughs> no, they do not. <laughs> it's still radio the whole time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I love radio. I'm sad about radio, yeah. but... Uh, you know, I, I've had a great uh, 46 years in radio, 19 of them, almost half of it is your tech guy. And yeah. it, I just, I want to go out on a high note, you know, <laughs> I don't want to be a, like Tom Brady. I want to go out a uh, winner. So, yeah, yeah. I thought it was better to do that than to fade away. Well, and <laughs> when it's your choice, it's always better yeah. too, because <laughs> yeah. so often it's not. <laughs> yeah. In radio. Right. Yes, that's right. So we are still taking calls. We are. Please tell callers I don't want any tears. I can't make any promises with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try not to break myself. No, no so. tears. <laughs> uh, By the end of this show, I'll be sobbing, I'm sure. Yeah. And we're still, and as I said, I'm still podcasting. I'm still podcasting. Uh, so that will continue uh, until uh, until I can't do that anymore. And then I'll uh, say goodbye to that too. Yeah. It's not hard to retire. It's hard. I thought it'd be harder. I thought I'd really be... Uh, upset today i think you will be when you give it all the up, last the last words dribble out of my mouth and i yeah, say you're goodbye. still gonna have a microphone in front of your face so yeah <laughs> people still have to listen to they, me well yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you kim who should i start with well, here you know your service your i have had service. an offline conversation and told mike b that he must still keep you on task and make you do your commercials he's so. the guy who makes me do my spots <laughs> yeah, yeah. Breeze, mike from piscata Hey, New Jersey. Thank you, Kim. Mr. Michael B. Hello, Leo. Hey, Mike I B. There. I was there for show number one for your radio, so I had to make sure I was here for Were you really? the final radio. I was one of your original cha channel moderators. Don't forget that. Yeah. That was January 2nd, 2004. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. You were there at the beginning, and we have, we've always had chat. I've had chat even before I was the tech guy. I like having... Uh, 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 kibitzers in the background <laughs> telling me what I'm doing wrong. I like that, believe it or not. So back in in uh, 2004, there was no vi video. There was a was it like a three com net cam? I had a I had like still that. pictures setting out every 30 seconds. Fresh, exactly. So we would watch the the picture refresh every 30 <laughs> seconds while we would listen to the stream because you were still local back then. Yeah. On, uh, on KFI. That's right. So we would hear all the ads and, and everything yep. and have a little fun with the ads. And <laughs> it was it was it was a lot of fun back then. It still is now. Um, is it different? And, uh, I can't really tell. And I don't I fortunately I don't I don't really know. I guess I do have recordings. Come to think of it. I have the very first show. But yeah, is it different? Do you think? It's a little, the format changed only slightly because I think in some ways you're kind of bringing the some of the format from tech TV onto the radio show. Yeah. Yeah. And over time it evolved. Yeah. Evolution is always 
I believe, always for the better. I remember uh, way back when you would have like a poll question of the day. We would to channel moderators to try to think of a poll question. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> way, way back when. If you go to archive.org, you can find those old uh, website pages. Um, yeah, and you might need real players in order to listen. Yes, to exactly. <laughs> exactly. Actually, we put the, the first episode is on our website. I guess we lost uh, episodes two through nine for some reason. Um, oh. But the first uh, episode is yeah. up at twit.tv slash TTG1 is the very first exactly. episode. Yeah. Yeah. And I was even mentioned on the very first. Were show. you? You know. can prove yeah, that you can prove what... you were there because I talked about Mike B. Yeah. I, I don't remember what it was, but yeah, because I, I know I had to think of uh, a poll question and you were always telling people back then never send emails with attachments. Yeah. And I still say that, by the way. And one of my jobs was to send you uh, an email. With an attachment uh, for the I, chat I, room. <laughs> <laughs> so I was one of your worst offenders in, in doing that directly to you. But it was always text, so I didn't worry too much. You didn't send me PDFs or, or doc files, so it was okay. I still say, it's funny, you'd think we'd, in 19 years we'd have come some, a little farther along. But spam's still a problem, malware's still a problem, attachments in the email, still a problem. Still, and phone spam and it's yeah it's gotten worse gotten, yeah it's gotten worse yeah absolutely yeah um internet like any any technology is both good and bad and again i want to remind all of your listeners and viewers who are watching your radio program as an odd sentence that that may be that you're not again you're not going anywhere thank you mike you're just not going to be over analog airways People are still, there's going to be a, a show 1955 in a few weeks. Yeah. And 55 will be the best of podcast. And uh, right. techguylabs.com will have a brand new show with Micah and me. I thought I'd bring in some youth. Uh, 55 yep. is tomorrow and 56 is, 55 is tomorrow. No, it's not tomorrow. What do you think tomorrow is, Benito? I'm not being going to be here tomorrow. <laughs> but Benito. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we'll do tomorrow. We'll do fifty five tomorrow. No, that'll come out uh, next Saturday. Uh, the best of. Uh, yes. If you're listening to the radio, uh, the wonderful Professor Laura, who is also continuing on with Rich on Tech, Rich tomorrow, uh, we'll do a best of. Poor woman has to come in Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, and New Year's Day to put together best of. So there'll still be more of this show. We're gonna go out uh, with a whimper, not a bang, and then uh, and then Rich starts his. Uh, 19 years. And I made him promise, by the way, that he'd do this for 19 years uh, on uh, January 7th. He is this roughly the same age I was when I started and has kids the same age I had. That's one of the weird things for me is I, when I started doing this, uh, Henry was, uh, how old was Henry? He was nine years old and uh, Abby was 11 years old. And now they're 28 and 30. <laughs> so, so we'll it just, it's interesting how time flies when you're, uh, when you're not paying attention. Leo, will any of his listeners and or viewers get him to shave his head like we did for two Oh, yeah. One New Year's Eve. Not a, that's how you know you had a good New Year. When you wake <laughs> up the next morning, your head is shaved and you have a tattoo on a your tattoo. butt. But in this case, it was a good New Year because it was uh, to raise money for UNICEF. And we did. We raised, I think, $80,000 for a UNICEF. Some of the best money I ever spent. Oh. Mike B., thank you for your years of service. Are you going to retire now? I don't know. I may still still tune in from time to time. I hope you will. Thank you, Mike thank B. You. I really appreciate it. Coming up, Sam and Bull Sam. And yeah, there'll be some actual content in the show. <laughs> by hook or by crook. We're going to talk cars when we come back. Thank you, Mike. That's very sweet. Do 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 do. Yeah, we have to. I have to get. Um, thank you for that web archive. Yeah, I mean, all of the shows are. I guess we still have. Uh, Patrick said the reason that nine, uh, two through nine aren't on the website is because. Uh, they they were divided into three parts, and so we we gotta. But if he's if we'll figure it out, we'll get them up there. It's weird that we have never put them up. It's not so hard to take four MP3s or three MP3s and make it one. It isn't. We have the technology. Oh oh, Mike had a question. Oh, 
Well, that was probably more pro forma, right? He was just pretending to have a question. It's a hard computer science problem is right. So did you watch the uh, the World Cup today, Sam, this morning? I did not. Uh, I don't have any uh, any services where I can watch live TV. Oh, and I don't, really? I don't watch live sports except for, uh, except for some auto racing, which I stream. Interesting. Yeah. We, we dropped our cable about eight years ago, seven or eight years ago, and uh, haven't had anything since then. Although this morning, as I was heading out to walk Daisy, uh, I saw three trucks from GTE, our local utility. Yeah. They were finally coming around to put in to replace a hundred year old utility pole. Oh my God. On my neighbor's house, um, which was necessary in order to get my AT&T fiber hooked up. <gasps> AT&T finally ran fiber in my neighborhood. Oh. They came around a few weeks ago, oh. door to door. That's exciting. And I ordered it. And a couple of days later, the guy came up to do the install and said, yeah, I can't do the install because I stuck. I saw the bottom of the utility pole was rotted and I stuck my probe in there, went halfway through the pole and said, oh, I'm not going dear. up that pole. And so they had to call D DTE owns the pole. They had to get DTE to do it. So they, they actually brought out a new pole and laid it out in the front yard of my neighbor's house for the last three weeks. <laughs> oh, and then fi finally this morning, the truck came around to, uh, uh, to actually do the installation. Can you so believe the that now here we are in the 21st century and we're still sticking wooden poles in the ground to hold up wires. I know. It's amazing. It seems pretty antiquated. Primitive? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but at least I will have uh, symmetrical gigabit fiber uh, with, oh. hopefully within a few days. Oh, you're going to love that. That's for, really for, nice. For, with, with no uh, no data caps and hopefully, f and it'll be for about the same as what I'm paying um, Comcast now to get. 700 down and 25 up nice yeah you're gonna really love that that's a big improvement yeah yeah big improvement we have gigabit not, i'm not crazy about signing up with at&t but know. you know the, know the other local fiber company stopped doing their build out about three blocks away from me uh and you know hasn't hasn't continued and so i'll take what i can get yeah it's primitive come on it's ugly yeah. too uh, the alternative, of course, is doing underground, but that's expensive, so yeah. not, they don't do it. But uh, it's pretty darn primitive. <laughs> it's ugly. I mean, we're just used to it, right? We're, we're, for a long time, we were used to seeing those big television antennas on roofs. Oh, yeah. But if you, it really is ugly. I know as a photographer, I'm always editing out lines and wires and telephone poles. All right, here we go. Our show today brought to you by those great folks at Cashfly. When I say brought to you by Cashfly, I mean literally brought to you by Cashfly. Cashfly is our content delivery network, or CDN. That means whenever you download the show, whether you do it uh, in your podcast player or from our website, you're getting it from a Cashfly server close to you. Cashfly has 50 points of presence all over the world. So it's a much faster way to get our content, to get it directly from Cashfly. And frankly, <laughs> that's, that's kind of the way the world is moving, right? We're all going digital. Traffic patterns are spiking all over the place. Viewers don't hang around if your if your podcasts don't download right away. The videos buffer if your you know your shopping carts freeze, spinning, spinning, spinning. They're just going to abandon those shopping carts. And don't get me started with gamers. You, high latency is the end of the world for a gamer. That's why games, e-commerce sites, video distributors, podcasters love Cashfly. Cashfly gives your customers a faultless experience when they're engaging with your content, any device, anytime, anywhere in the world. They've been doing this for 20 years. They've been a leader in CDN since 2002. They hold the track record for high-performing, ultra-reliable content delivery for the last 20 years. In fact, they pioneered something now a lot of people are copying, TCP Anycast. That was... That's Cashfly. They're innovators in this space. The most important metric from your point of view, from our point of view, is quality of experience. When you're serving content to a large distributed audience on a global scale like we are, giving them quality of experience, even if they don't know it 
consciously is huge, right? If, if the downloads freeze or halt or fail, you're going to lose a customer. With Cashfly, we've been using them for almost all those 20 years, for almost 15 now, never had a problem. You can get ultra low latency video streaming. This is another area they've just innovated in, HLS streaming that's going to deliver video to more than a million concurrent users. Lightning fast gaming, faster downloads, zero lag, zero glitches, zero outages, mobile content optimization for your website that delivers automatic and simple image optimization so your site loads faster on any device. That's automatic. Multiple CDNs means you get redundancy and failover. Cashfly intelligently balances your traffic across multiple providers so you get the shortest routes and mitigating against performance glitches. That's how Cashfly can give you 100% availability over the last 12 months that's how they do it plus you'll never pay for service overlap again you get flexible month-to-month -month billing for as long as you need it discounts for fixed terms once you're happy you design your own contract when you switch to cash fly that's what we did we negotiated a great deal and we love we love cash fly for over 10 years we've been using it we wouldn't have it any other way Cashfly with more than 3,500 clients in over 80 countries 50 points of presence Organizations like us consistently choose Cashfly for their scalability, reliability, unrivaled performance. Cashfly, the only CDN built for throughput, delivering media-rich content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods, up to 30% faster than other major CDNs. Learn how you can get your first month free at Cashfly.com. C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y, Cashfly.com. Thank you, Cashfly, for all these years of uh, supporting the Tech Guy Show. I really appreciate it. C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Back to the show. He is our low-riding car guru, Sam Abel Samad, principal researcher at Guidehouse Insights. He's at wheelbearings.media. And uh, his last appearance on the Tech Guy Show is right now. Hi, Sam. Hi, Leo, and it's an honor to be with you today on your last day on the radio. You and I will continue to work together, and uh, so I'm not. I hope so. I'm not saying goodbye to you, of course, <laughs> just our listeners. But uh, and maybe and one, one thing I haven't Hopefully found most out, of them will come along too. Yeah, and I'm, I I don't know yet if Rich is going to uh, bring uh, some of our contributors over. He says he's interested, so uh, he hasn't yet uh, let me know whether he wants to do that or let you know whether he wants to do that. But I hope he does. He's got a few weeks. He's you know what Rich is doing. He's enjoying his last few weekends with his kids, <laughs> and I think that's a really good thing to do. I would be doing it too if I. Well, were I'm sure him. that's probably why he's only doing Saturdays. Yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. I made the mistake of doing Saturdays and Sundays. In fact, when I first started doing it, I was doing seven days a week because I was working on tech TV Monday through Friday and doing the radio show on the weekends. That was a, oh, well, <laughs> time, well I, I, it's no time for regrets. We're, we're here. That's we are right. 19 years later. So, uh, Sam, you're sitting in front of a very large display there on that Toyota. What is that? I am. That is uh, the Toyota new Toyota Tundra uh, that I was driving last week. And the reason why I've got this particular image up over my shoulder here is uh, earlier I was checking in on the, uh, the Discord and saw there was a, a question that had been posed to me. And for the life of me now, I cannot find it again, so I can't credit who <laughs> asked the question. I've searched. I don't know. That's I'm okay. They know, they know who they are. Okay. Thank you for the yeah. question, whoever you are. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the question was about, um, you know, basically hacking the audio systems of newer cars. Is that something, you know, like replacing, replacing the audio systems in new cars? Is that something we're going to be able to do? Or are we going to see the car audio departments of stores and, you know, car audio shops go away um, in, in the, the near future? And so, you know, this is an example of a typical modern vehicle. Uh, the Tundra has got a 14-inch touchscreen display sitting up on top of the dashboard with their new um, uh, their new uh, infotainment system in there, which, uh, by the way, is vastly improved from the old Toyota infotainment system, which was, let's just say, not good. Um, but uh, the the new the new system is much better. Um, you can say, "Hey, Toyota." Uh, and it'll do, you know, do all kinds of stuff for you. Um, and it also has support for Apple CarPlay and, and Android Auto. That's wirelessly. to me, that is uh, kind of table stakes. I got to have that. Mm -hmm. 
In fact, that's one reason but, I stopped using uh, driving a Tesla. I'm one of many, but I I, yeah. I, I like having Apple CarPlay or Android Auto in there. I I think they're really good systems. I I, I agree, um, and you know I think it, it's nice to have the flexibility to do that. And going forward, that is probably the only flexibility we will have. Um, you know, for for a long time, for many many years, um, vehicles had standardized at least in terms of the form factor had a standard form factor uh head unit for the audio system in there uh it was known the the, the slimmer ones were known as a single din uh it, there was, it was a european standard for the size of the the head unit to fit in the dashboard um the, the slim ones were single din and then there was also double din so the taller ones it was basically just double height a double height version of the same thing and so you could go and buy, you know, a single DIN or a double DIN head unit from any of dozens of different manufacturers um, and, and, you know, rip out your old head unit, and put in a new one that had more features or more power, additional speakers, you know, all kinds of other features. Uh, more recent years, uh, the last six or seven years, they've started offering uh, aftermarket units that have uh, CarPlay and Android Auto built in for older cars that don't have that. Uh, and it was really nice because it was that it was a standard form factor. It was generally very easy to install in just about any vehicle. Unfortunately, these newer vehicles, pretty much anything built in the last four or five years and, and almost everything going forward has got a built in touchscreen, you know, that are getting larger and larger. Yeah, how big is that Toyota? It looks like 27 that, that inches one, or something. That, was, that one's 14 inches. 14. It just feels yeah, big so in a, a car dashboard. Little, little, yeah, a little bit bigger than the uh, than the big iPad Pro. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so, and it's a big, and that, there are bigger screens out there. The Tesla Model S and X have 17 inches. Um, the, uh, uh, the Cadillac Escalade, you know, I mean, they actually have three separate displays that are that they they just add up the total is 37 inches but you know it's actually like a 17 inch uh infotainment display in the center uh and the thing is you can't replace these with any kind of um aftermarket system uh because the the dashboard design itself is not designed to accommodate any kind of aftermarket system so if you buy a newer vehicle you're basically stuck with what's in there. But the only thing you might be able to do is perhaps upgrade the speakers, um, you know, which are mounted in the doors and, and other places. You might be able to put better speakers in. But most modern vehicles have pretty good, high-quality speakers in them anyway, so you don't really need to do that. Um, and to to be fair, you know, on the plus side, you know, because you do have CarPlay and Android Auto, you've got flexibility there, at least in terms of the user interface. Um, most newer vehicles have decently powered uh, infotainment systems, so you've got en enough volume to to do damage to your ears. Um, uh, so. But it is kind of the way of the vehicle these days mm -hmm. that there are no user serviceable parts inside. Yeah, uh, you, I used to do tune-ups in my old Volkswagen. <laughs> that you can't yeah, do I've that. <laughs> countless, countless tune-ups and stuff. And I changed the, the oil. The, the plus, on my old, I guess the, you can still change is, the oil on a on a gas vehicle. So yeah, that's the, still yeah pretty aside easy to do. aside from oil changes, most modern vehicles don't really need any engine service. You yeah. know, for many tens of thousands of miles. Right. Um, many of them, you know, as, apart from oil changes, you can go uh, pretty much a hundred thousand miles without wow. really doing anything to the engine, wow. except that oil changes and air filters. Those are the two things that and, you want to oh, do. Let's not forget wiper fluid. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, where, where, where items, you know, things, yeah. things like wiper fluid, wiper blades, wash, yeah. wiper blades yeah, things yeah, like that, yeah. you know, tires, you know, but I mean, in terms of actual anything, any actual service on the engine, you can't get in. You, know, there, you don't. You don't yeah. need to replace spark plugs or yeah. anything like that. Same there's thing no with points. Frankly, it's the same thing with TVs. You, you. There's mm -hmm. nothing to service inside a modern TV. It used to be TV repair shops on every corner of Main Street, USA, and now there's nothing they can do. You know. Uh, although, um, you know, I I actually have done service on a modern TV a few years ago. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Our our Vizio TV. Uh, we had a 55 inch Vizio. Uh, and one time I was away on a business trip and my wife calls me up while I'm at dinner uh, with some folks from Jaguar. She said, I can't turn the TV on. I, I said, well, try pulling the plug out and wait a second, wait a couple seconds and put it you back in. You rebooted it. That, did, that, that didn't work. Yeah. I said, well, there's not much else I can do right now. Uh, when we got home, we went to Costco and bought a new 4K TV. 
I put the other one in the basement and then a few weeks later started doing a little research and found that with that particular Vizio, there's, there's basically four circuit boards inside. And it turns out that sometimes the, uh, the solder joints on the, um, the connector between the main power board and the main logic board would crack. And so I just opened up the back, took out that power board, ref you know, got my soldering iron out, reflowed the, the solder connections on there, plugged it all back in, worked fine. Nice. So, Aren't yeah. you handy? Now yeah, try that with your uh, try that with your thanks. Miata and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> you can well, still fortunately you the, can still do the, the Miata doesn't need stuff like that. <laughs> but to back to the original topic of the audio systems, one thing I did want to mention is there are 290 million registered vehicles in the United States. Average age is over 12 years old now, so there's still you know a couple hundred million cars on the road that do have. Um, standardized DIN or double DIN audio systems that if you want to upgrade those, you can, you know, you'll be, there will be a market for aftermarket it audio systems. It does explain though, we used to have a, you know, car stereo, th aftermarket car stereo place uh -huh. uh, down here and it went out of business a couple of years ago. Now I understand why there's not, you can't do as much as you used to. Sam Abul yeah. Sam at Guidehouse Insights is his day job, his podcast, Wheel Bearings at wheelbearings.media. Sam, it's been a, it's been a joy. Leo Laporte. Thank you, Leo. Guy. Do you want to stick around for the rest of the show all the time, every day, all the time? Sure. At least through the top of the hour. All right. Cold and gray out. There's not, nothing else to do. So. Yeah, winter. Winter has come. <laughs> well, yeah. D Doug M says, always change your blinker fluid. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. Well, actually, speaking of blinkers, I think uh, I was listening uh, if it was Twig or... One of the, one of, or maybe it was Twit from last week. Um, you guys were talking about uh, the sound of um, the blinkers. Uh, yeah. On uh, on some modern car, on some it was some modern car. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it was mentioned that you know the traditional clicking sound when you turn on your when you put on your turn signals or your hazard lights uh, comes from the fact that in older vehicles there was a mechanical relay, an electric relay, that was in the wiring that um, basically open, as soon as you turned on the, you know, press the, uh, the stock and uh, triggered it, it would send current through that relay, which would cause the relay to open and close. And that was what the clicking sound was from your blinkers that turned the lights on and off. Um, and modern vehicles, because all that stuff is solid state, those relays are all gone. So you don't need any of that, but they still wanted to provide some, feedback, some sort of haptic feedback to drivers about what was going on, you know, to, to let them know, you know, in case they weren't glancing down at their, their instrument cluster, to let them know that their turn signals was, were on. And um, so they've, they've had to come up with sounds, different sounds for this. Did they uh, used actually, to be think physical my, clickers in the early days? Yeah. Well, it, it was, it was a relay. It was, a, it was a, so, just a, so it was a actually mechanical clacking. relay. The relay was clacking. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So the sound you were hearing was actually the switch inside the relay opening and closing uh, yeah. as, as it went down. Not anymore. And so, <laughs> yeah. So now, now they've had to come up with synthetic sounds to give you that same kind of feedback. And I was at an event last year with, uh, with Volvo uh, for a drive program for the new Volvo C40 uh, EV. And one of their designers was talking about sound design and, and sound design with EVs is very important because EVs don't make any much, you know, they don't have an engine sound that masks everything right. else. Uh, and so they have to come up with sounds for the various pleasant. things. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're pleasant or, you know, give various my, types of my Mustang of, of is feedback. musical. It did not with a clicker. Yeah. The clicker is a normal clicker, but the, but the, when you turn it on, it goes, it's really well, for, silly. for the, for the turn signal, you know, they said their sound designers um, had were walking through the woods in Sweden, oh, looking for sound, you know, with a with a recorder, looking for sounds. That's awesome. And one of them stepped on a twig, and the snap of the twig. They thought, oh, that's a cool sound. Perfect. And so they they recorded that. And that, if you get a modern Volvo um, that you know that's a plug-in hybrid or battery electric vehicle. That's what it actually has as the sound of the turn signals. Wow. It's actually the sound of a twig being stepped on in a Swedish forest. Wow. Uh, so, wow. you know, and, uh, you know, some sounds are, are natural sounds like that. 
Uh, others are completely synthesized sounds. Like I think I've talked before, uh, BMW for their EVs, they hired um, Hans Zimmer to create sounds to to compose sounds that they use for their evs for their modern Perfect. evs of course yeah yeah uh you want to stick around for the top sure okie dokie we'll talk in a few mr sammy abul sammy actually i i guess i cut you off early you got 23 seconds oh say something quick all right. Um, well, I, I do agree that BMW does require wallet flushes on a regular basis. I like basis. that. That was pretty funny. Mr. Mister. That was a good yeah. line. I like that. Yeah. All right. I actually, uh, well, I'll talk to you in a bit. Okay. It is one of my favorites. Yeah. Who told you that? Oh, <laughs> two years ago, I mentioned I like this song, and now I'm going to hear it every Christmas no, I guess not. Thank you, Professor Laura, for playing some nice holiday music. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, next week, of course, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Do you have to come in to do those, Laura? Yes, I do. She will be working, playing old clips. <laughs> the, oh, we like to think of it as the best of uh, the Tech Guy show. Same thing for New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Oh, mm -hmm. I, am, I am sorry. But who else can do it? No one else can do it. Only you can Only do it. Me. Yeah, yeah, so you have to do it. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate it. Uh, Perry on the line from Glendale, California. I'll be thinking about Laura when I'm drinking eggnog on Christmas Eve. I'll be thinking about you. What can I do for you, Perry? Oh, good afternoon. And I was thinking of an analogy of you shifting your your profession. I was thinking that you were moving from a from a truck. To a car that was on the Jetsons. Yeah, kind of. Kind of more modern. The internet. You know, it's yeah. interesting to compare radio and the internet because the internet is global. It's pretty much free to do a podcast. No, Nobody, uh, you know, you could put it almost anywhere, YouTube and other places for free. And anybody all around the world can get it. There's no tower, no license, no transmitter. It's a really, it's a very different uh, medium. But the difference, the big difference is in cost because with a radio a show, a radio station, you put up a tower and a transmitter, that's an initial cost. But then if a million people listen or a hundred million people listen doesn't cost you any more. They don't use more electricity. Whereas with the internet, every single person who downloads a show or listens to the show is uh, is potentially costing you money unless you're on YouTube or somewhere like It's costing somebody money, let's put it that way. So there's a different these, business model. These. Well... Well, that, the best to you moving forward. Thank I know, you, sir. I know you're going to gain some different different kind of wings, if you will. <laughs> uh, I've earned my wings on radio. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Reason I'm calling is I was um my my issue had had shifted a little bit while I was waiting, and to, to, to try to make this very quick, I had disabled my. My PIN, I, I, Windows 11, disabled my password, and I wanted to eliminate all of that. You know, if, if my screen saver goes off, then all of a sudden I have to do use my PIN again. Well, I went ahead and I dismantled both, and then I, all of a sudden I realized that when my screen saver comes on, you know, and then I go take my mouse and I jiggle it to make it come back, yeah. I'm back to the... You need a pin. To get a pin. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, well, well, what happened? And then I was realized the change, also an, an added layer of the issue was when the screen goes black, I cut, it comes in, I jiggle, it comes back, and then now it wants the password. I do the password, <laughs> and then it wants the pin, and then... I thought I disabled all of that. So what there's there are there are places to do this. Uh, I, I'm glad you didn't actually get rid of your pin and password because, as you can see, there are times when you will need it. But yeah. you can disable the pin and the password. You can even go into your settings and your screensaver and say, "I don't want to have to log back in." That makes sense if you're the only person who has access, physical access to your machine. Uh, or, you know, you're not worried about the other people living with you, uh, then that makes sense. Why why log in every time? And it doesn't make you more secure to, to bad guys particularly. So uh, there are several things to do, uh, and some of them are a little obscure, for instance, um, but I am going to put a link to the Microsoft page that describes all of this, and I'll put that up in the okay. show notes. But if you if if it's you so Google involved. yeah if you if you Google um, let's see what did I, what, what would be the best uh, terms let's see Windows eleven 
without password. Try that. Uh, you should probably okay. find those articles right away. There's also one the chat room found on Make Use Of that's Turn Off Password on Wake. Um, so if you Google Turn Off Password on Wake, Windows 11, oh. or turn or Windows 11 without password, there's a set of steps that Microsoft doesn't make completely obvious, but you can do it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with doing it. There's perhaps... Uh, if somebody had, let's see, how could, yeah, no, there's, it, it's only to local attackers that that makes any difference. Somebody on the internet is still going to have to get into your machine. So I think you're good on right. it. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, perfect. And then yeah. one last note. There, sure. A little bit of success. Months ago, I called you, I asked you about a, you know, a, a middle of the road phone and you had given me, I think it was a Motorola. And then I decided to pull the trigger and I went from a, a, to a 53G. I love that phone. That's actually there. That's the one I would recommend if you asked me today. That's, that's pretty new. That's great that you got that. Good. The oh, A53 I, I from it. Samsung. Uh, Cause you're yeah. getting 5G, which is nice. And how much more expensive was it? It wasn't very expensive, right? Well, it was on sale at, at a retailer. I probably shouldn't say, but I I, I did get it uh, the a hundred bucks off. They were doing a promo. So I was in and out of there in a half an hour. Nice. I love it. Yeah, it's absolutely wonderful. I mean, I I did you know come from the Flintstones to the you know <laughs> modern world with my I had my S four which I loved which was which was yeah. So you're a Samsung guy. So yeah, this nice makes phone. sense. Yeah. The the A series Samsungs are their mid range mid price phones and they're perfectly uh, perfectly good. I I have a little soft spot for Motorola for historic reasons. I think they make very good phones. The newest Motorolas are kind of impressive, but yeah, Samsung is the king of the hill. They they sell more Android phones than anybody. In fact, I think they probably sell more phones than anybody, including Apple. So uh, it's you can't go wrong with that. I'm glad to hear that worked no, out for no, you. It was Thank you. No, sure. I, I think you, I, I'm, I'm glad I was able to pull the pull the trigger and save a hundred bucks. Yeah, so that was yeah, that was good. So, so it was like around two hundred dollars. The insight. Yeah. 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 A, big, a big pardon. It ended up being around two hundred dollars, something like that. Yeah. 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 Great, I did, Perry. That, that was, that, that's that's what it was. Well, thank you, thank you very much. And again, the best. The best to you, and then we see if we can shake this uh, password uh, pin. I think you'll be able to. If, yeah, just do a Google until, because it takes us a while to get the uh, information up on the web page. We'll get it up there by later today for sure. Um, our editors put those uh, notes up. I don't. So um, it'll take them a little while. But if you just Google Windows 11 uh, without password, You'll see this. It's a good link. It's on the Microsoft uh, community site, so it's a it's a trustworthy link. Uh, but there are a few things to do. It's not immediately obvious what you do. John on the line, our friend from Portugal. How's your retirement going there on the beautiful Algarve of Portugal? It's going well. Uh, <laughs> I uh, I always think of you with envy, John. <laughs> Just as Sam said, it's an honor to be with you on your last terrestrial radio show. That's a good way to put it. And, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. I have been listening to you spanning four decades. Wow. I first heard you on a show called Leo Laporte and Company. And, and Company. Laporte and Company, yeah. On KNBR. Yeah. I was working on my house in Santa Cruz. I'll never forget Holy it. Holy cow. You had... You had like some lawyers you were interviewing. Yeah, we would. Uh, I did interviews, uh, just kind of general interviews, not technology stuff. Uh, yeah. Back in the back in the eighties. A clip of you like interviewing like Doctor John. He has a, was having a the, show. The, the Night Tripper. That was, was so much fun. I got to meet everybody who came to San Francisco. I'd get to meet everybody. I counted it up, and I think I did five thousand interviews in a few years. Um, wow. Yeah. It was great fun. I really enjoyed that. It was not great ratings. And uh, KNBR called me in, uh, I probably was around uh, 89 or 90 and said, uh, maybe 88, and said, uh, you know, there's this, not, this new young guy coming out of Sacramento named Rush Limbaugh. We're giving him your show. <laughs> and that was that. <laughs> but it worked out very well. You know, it's one of those things, uh, it's probably a good lesson for everybody uh, one door closes, another opens. That was the that was when I said maybe I should just my hobby is is is, is technology, is computers. Maybe I should just focus on that instead of this general talk because I'm not doing so well as a general talk show host. So uh, that's when I started focusing on computers, and that's worked out pretty well, I would say. It was a as they say, yeah, baseball been very good to me. You had that. 
you had the DJ voice. Yeah, I had the voice, but I didn't have the skills. You were like, okay. That's <laughs> yeah, I know. I talk like that. <laughs> Thank you, John in Portugal. More with the tech guy after this. <laughs> do you really remember that? My voice sounded like that? That's hysterical. That's I funny. remember. That was from the clip that I looked up That that's on the article. Yeah, it was a little more of a, we call that a puker. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're really you're yucking it up like okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've come a long way since then. <laughs> I hope. I remember you list like interviewing some lawyers, and I always think of KNBR's sports format. Yeah, but it was before they went sports. That's why it was before yeah, they went sports. I remember you? I fully remember that I was working on my house in Santa Cruz, up in Boulder Creek. That's and, so cool. And Leo Laporte. I loved doing okay. that. It was really a great job, but it wasn't great ratings. So. There you go. It's because it was somebody different every 15 minutes. I only These were short interviews. You're probably thinking of Steve Moskowitz, the uh, tax lawyer. Who was yeah, it was like lawyers on the line or something. Like yeah. With like yeah, I did. A, mostly it was just people who came to town. So it was book authors. It was m musicians. And it was great for me. <laughs> not, not so great. For the station, and uh, so I only did, got to do that for a few years. Hey, well, hey, John, I'm sure I'll talk to you again. Enjoy. Radio. I really, yeah. it's it, you're a, you're an inspiration. I want to end up next door. Please come visit. <laughs> okay, take care, John. <laughs> and when the studio opens, we'll come and see you. And yes, please do. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Take care. All yours, Sammy. Oops. Why don't I hear you? Because you're muted on your end. That's why. Oh, there we go. There I had go. Uh, hit, I had hit the mute button. My fault. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, yeah, just to follow up on the sounds uh, a little bit. Somebody in the uh, chat was mentioning about the uh, fart sounds that Tesla offers. Oh, yes, that Lord. is a real thing. Yes, uh, it's very uh, Elon, uh, isn't it? Oh, it is so, so Elon. Elon. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, you can, I think you can actually assign that to the horn sound as well as the turn signals. Yeah, I did it. Uh, um, you know, when I had a Model X, and I thought, oh, the kids will enjoy this. They hated it. <laughs> yeah, you can even do it externally. <laughs> it is like the worst, speaker. the worst dad joke. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, yeah so I yeah. only did it briefly. The funnest thing, and uh, I used to post this every Christmas, is it would do this whole Christmas lights and uh, music display. Oh yeah. That I mean, that's actually that a kind cool. of a cool thing. Yeah. One of the one of the neat little things you can do, you know, when you have a software updatable vehicle like that, and that's the direction that every manufacturer is going. Um, in fact, um, I was at uh, a Ford event earlier this week, and uh, Jim Farley, the CEO, said, "Yeah, we just uh, was just today earlier today looking at the uh, prototype for our next generation um, electrical and electronic architecture for their EVs. It's fully." updatable, you know, front to back, ev everything is updatable o o over the air. Um, and that's uh, using a, a, a zonal, or they call it a zonal architecture. So it's a central compute system. Yeah, because they don't want to crash a few zone controllers in the yeah, corners. Yeah. Well, one of, one of the big things about it is that um, uh, it dramatically reduces the wiring content. Uh, like modern vehicles have, it's all software. you know, yeah. three to four miles of wiring. Right. And and when they, when they compared the uh the model y to the mach e they they found the mach the mach e had a full one mile more of wiring <laughs> in it than the than the uh than the the tesla wow and they've they've eliminated that in their new system so okay. um new new vehicles will have a lot less wiring in there it should be more reliable as well right wiring is unreliable i uh yeah. you know i my car had a fault a frunk fault i mentioned i brought it in and uh, they updated, they fixed it. They were on the Ford hotline all day, apparently, and fixed it. But uh, they didn't put Blue Cruise again. And and she said, "Yeah, that's really? a, that says that takes fourteen hours. Uh, you have to that you'd have to bring Oof. that." In. And I don't really need it, but it's weird because I I thought I, I know I have the capability. It comes with the yeah. You should be able to do it OTA. That's what I thought, uh, but it's never yeah. done it OTA. So I don't know. Huh. I have automatic upgrades turned on and. It's always within Wi-Fi at work and at home, and it huh. still doesn't update. So that's fine. I don't. Right. It's just weird. That's the problem yeah. with OTA updates is you, you don't know what you're getting. Yeah. Sometimes they work. Sometimes they don't. Right. right. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, some few other things in the chat. Um, somebody was talking about uh, Macintosh audio, and uh, this is not, you know, an Apple computer in your car. 
Um, this is Macintosh is a different brand spelled differently. There's no A in Macintosh labs. Um, and they've been a high end home audio system for a long time. And one of their distinctive features is they have this blue backlighting on the meters on their, on their amps and receivers. And, uh, last year when they launched the uh, new Jeep Wagoneer, uh, Jeep did a deal with, with Macintosh as, as most automakers do with, for the premium audio systems in their cars with various brands. Um, uh, Lincoln does re uh, Revel. Um, there's a bunch of vehicles that have Bang & Olufsen. There's uh, Bowers & Wilkins. Uh, I think Volvo uses Bowers & Wilkins. And Jeep uh, selected Macintosh. Um, and one of, you know, so Macintosh helped design the, the speaker setup and the amps and everything. And one of the cool little features they have is one of the apps, because this, this is the infotainment actually runs on Android Automotive. Um, and so they have an app on there that emulates the look of the classic blue Macintosh meters. So you can have that on your center screen in, in the in the, the Jeep Wagoneer and the Jeep Grand Cherokee and soon in other Jeeps. Um, so if you like that look, you can get uh, uh, get a, a new Jeep and uh, it's it's has that look in there. Um, Mongo asked about the value of a, a 20 year old Ford van. Uh, with 28,000 miles on it. And I just did a quick look up on uh, kbb.com. It's a good place to look for price, you know, what the value of older vehicles is. And uh, a, a, a 2003 Ford Econoline uh, passenger van, uh, E150, uh, with 28,000 miles um, in very good condition, they say is worth about seven to $8,000, um, which seems like a lot for a 20 year old van, but yeah, I guess so. Um, Graveyard Tuba um, was talking about uh, sinking carbs, sinking carburetors um, on uh, like on an old MGB. This is something I actually learned how to do in high school uh, in auto shop class. My teacher had uh, picked up a, an old uh, a, a Triumph TR7 from his brother that wasn't running. And I spent a lot of time working on that car during my high school years. And one of the things I learned was how to balance the carburetors. When you've got multiple carburetors on there, they have to be balanced so the engine will run right. And uh, the way we did it, take a 12-inch long piece of garden hose um, and uh, a screwdriver and stick the, stick the hose into the carburetor and run the engine, rev the engine, and just listen to the other end of the hose, kind of like a stethoscope, and adjust the, the carburetor and then put it in the other one and adjust it until, until they all sound about the same. So you're getting the same flow through all the carburetors. Uh, not very high tech, uh, but it worked. Um, uh, I had gotten uh, a message, uh, I think, last week from uh, Micah from Maine um, on uh, on Twitter when I was still looking at Twitter uh, about AM radio and how a lot of uh, newer EVs are ditching AM radio, which you know maybe makes it a good time for Leo to be getting out of the radio business. Um, and Tesla was one of the first to do this uh, to stop include you know to not include AM radio in their vehicles. Uh, a few others have done it since then. Most most EVs still do have AM radio, uh, but it is more challenging to do it. Um, AM I guess AM tuners are a little more susceptible to electromagnetic interference, and of course when you've got a big honking battery under the floor, uh, you may have some some challenges with uh, with EMI. Um, and you know, that can, that can impact electronics. And so rather than try to shield everything properly, some automakers are just saying, yeah, you know, there's not as much demand for AM radio. So we're just not going to bother anymore. Um, and, um, so I think, you know, it's some for, for now, most vehicles still have AM radio. GM still does it. Others, uh, others still do it, but in the future, we will probably see fewer and fewer, vehicles with am radio in there which for those that are fans of it yeah. uh user 3928 uh asked his mom has a uh, toyota rav4 uh, lease is up next summer she wants to get a bz4x uh that's toyota's first ev wanted to know what other uh, suvs you'd recommend for her to consider um i would recommend uh, pretty much any other current ev uh i'm the bz4x is okay but it's just kind of meh you know it's not uh short the slowing the charge is Charging is slow. Range is okay. It's not great. Uh, I would look at the VW ID4, uh, the Hyundai Ionic 5, uh, the Hyundai Kona EV, and the Kia Nero. Uh, and if she can wait till the fall, the Chevy Equinox EV as well is going to be another good one. Yeah, I'm looking at that myself.
Don't worry, we will have Sam back all the time on the new show. But uh, thank you, Sam, for your years of service Thanks, Leo. to the tech guy. I really appreciate it. Have a great all right, week. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Have a great holiday if I don't you talk too. to you before then. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, you know, all that jazz. The stuff that's that's changing the world all around us. That's what we've been talking about uh, here for the last 19 years. And it, it has changed a lot. It has changed a lot over 19 years. Uh, but it's still, I think, eternally fascinating, uh, both wonderful and horrific at the same time. <laughs> Um, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a very interesting 19. I think it's going to be a very interesting 19 to come with uh, Rich DeMuro. Rich on Tech starts January 7th. Raymond in San Fernando Valley. You're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Raymond. Hi, how you doing, sir? Mm. I am doing great. How are you? Fine, fine. Hey, um, make a long story short. My mom's 85 years old. I want to get her a 36 inch TV for her nursing home room. Nice. But I need, but I need a TV that when you turn it off, it still stays on. The, and you turn it on, it stays on the first same input that was turned off at night. <laughs> you know, I want that for my mom too. It drives her nuts. Well, my uh, mom's already nuts. <laughs> so I got help her. <laughs> my mom's a little older than yours, but uh, it drives her nuts too. She's. Uh, uh, I have to explain to her, no, mom, you have to get the remote, push the button, and go to na 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 na. She says it keeps part, and the reason, by the way, this happens with so many TVs now is it's advertising. They the they they don't leave you like the old TVs. You were watching Channel Five. You don't turn it on, and Channel Five's there. They want to put their interface up and show you all the wonderful things in that TV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think that that is. You know, unfortunately, probably how things are going to happen. Joe in our chat room says he has a TCL 8 series. Now, Joe, here's okay. the question. It's not that it's changing from HDMI 1 to HDMI 2. It's that it's not still on that channel. You know, mom goes to bed watching Channel 5. She wants to turn it on, and Channel 5 is on when she turns it on again. Is no, that no, 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 no. No? She, what she wants, well, I got to stay on the same input. You know, you got input one, input two. Oh, so, so it is input switching two. inputs. Well, that's terrible. Well, no, no, no. no. I got a Roku TV. It says, which input do you want? <sighs> and you got to click, oh, I want my first input. Yeah. It should, it okay. shouldn't, it should just assume that you want to stay on the same input. That's. No, I mean, I, I got a Roku TV. You turn it on, after, you know, go to bed, turn it on. It says, and it gives you choices of what input. You go to home. You go to the input and you put it which on. I need something for my mom when she goes to sleep. Turns it back on. It's still an input one. Well, try TCL. The nice thing about okay. TCL is they're very inexpensive. What I would do before you buy those is go somewhere where they have one on and try it and make sure that you can turn it off and not. Joe says you can set the default input on power on in the TCL menu. So it will it will do that every time. TCL is actually a good choice. Those are inexpensive. Um, you probably won't spend more than 100 bucks for a small TCL. Uh, it, the reason is it's a Chinese company, TCL and Hisense both, uh, who were watching what happened with Samsung and LG. You may not remember it. Some people do. LG used to be the TV Lucky Gold Star. You would buy it. It would be in the back of the drugstore, the cheap TV in the back of the drugstore. The quality were the Japanese TVs, the Sonys, right, of the world, the Sharps. Samsung and LG made a concerted effort about 20, 30 years ago to become a quality brand, to revitalize their brand. And they did it so successfully that Sony's been struggling. Sharps <laughs> gone. Uh, I think Are they out of the business? I think they are. Uh, and the dominant brands now are LG and Samsung. Well, the Chinese companies were looking at that and saying, hey, we could do that too. So TCL and Hisense, now this is a good thing because for consumers right now, TCL and Hisense are still struggling to get the name recognition. So they are aggressively priced, very aggressively priced. So I think a good TCL, that's what, I, by the way, that's what I got my mom. Uh, she's got TCLs in the living room and the bedroom. Um, so... TCL4, uh, see, this is interesting. We're getting conflicting information from the chat room. 
Vic in the chat room says, my TCL4 series, when you turn it on, asks what input to default to. Oh, but does it then remember it, Vic, from then on? Like, does it stay there? Joe has given me a uh, link to TCL support that says how to set what your TCL Roku TV displays on power on. So this is this is the information. You choose what, what, your, what screen your TCL Roku will display on when powering on. By default, your TV set to display the home screen. Right, we don't want to see that. So you go in. I'll put this in the show notes. Press the home button. Scroll down to settings, right arrow, right arrow. You want to go to the power on setting. And there is a menu item. You could choose home screen, last used TV input, HDMI one, two, three. Oh, that's nice. That's exactly, that's exactly what you're looking for. That's exactly what you're looking for, Raymond. So I'll put this link in the show notes so that uh, you can verify it. But this looks like uh, this is... Uh, something you can set in all of the TCL Roku displays now. You could say, whenever I turn it on, I want to do this. Clearly, your mom's not the only one who wanted that. Yay. Dave in Temecula is next. Hi, Dave. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah to you, too. First night of Hanukkah tonight. Yes, it is. I have a special um, song for uh, Rod Pyle, our space guy, coming up in a couple of hours. A special version of Rocket Man I'm going to play for him, just for Hanukkah. Anyway, <laughs> what's going on in your world, Dave? So I'm, I'm wondering if you might be able to bail me out here. I've got a Google phone. It's a Pixel 4a. Love the phone. Mm -hmm. And I have Mint Mobile service. Love nice. the service. Everything's good. They're a sponsor. I, Ryan Reynolds Phone Company. Yep. Right, right. <laughs> so I I lost some very important text, and I'm wondering oh. if there's any way or any type of program to recover them. Ah, uh, hmm. Mint Mobile probably has access to them, so you might call them. But, of course, uh, as a low-price phone company, who knows what kind of uh, support they're willing to give you. But they certainly have access to it. If, if for instance, if law enforcement called them, they would, they would hand them over right away because uh, it goes through their system. But I don't know of any way, if, if, it's, if it's been deleted from the Android device... I mean, there is, a, you know, it's worth a try. In the Google Play Store, there is an SMS backup program called SMS Backup and Restore that does this. Um, I think my guess is if it's, if the, did you delete it? How did it, what happened to it? Yeah, you know, it just says you go through and you clean up. Yeah, yeah. Messages. I ended yeah. deleted it, and then I realized I really needed it. And I know I'm not law enforcement, and they're not going to give it to me, and I don't want to have to murder somebody to get it. So. <laughs> law enforcement can get it, but uh, can you? I don't know. So try, so SMS Backup and Restore is free. You can try it. Um I, my guess is it's not going to restore anything that is already deleted, but sometimes that stuff is saved. Uh, for instance, Samsung has backups. Google probably, if, if you turned on your Google backups, has some backups. It might be, especially if you do it quickly, you know, what? because this happens so often, a lot of companies do, is they wait 30 days to really delete it. So they put, you know, oh. that's, that's the old put it in the trash can and let it sit for 30 days. Um, so there's some possibility... There's some possibility that that's that that's happened, um, and and again, Mint Mobile. If you if you call them, Mint Mobile uh, almost certainly has access to it. If it was sent via SMS, which it probably was, uh, they almost certainly have access to it. Look and see uh, if Google has backed it up. Uh, it depends which Android uh, app you're using for uh, your SMSs. Um, it may have a trash can. You can look and see. But once it's deleted and emptied and the trash is emptied, I know of no way to get it back. It's not like a file where the deletion leaves the file data on the drive. I think it's a, it's a different system. It's more like if you delete email. But if somebody knows better, well, let me know. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. Chris Marquardt, our photo guy, coming up at the bottom of the hour. Lots more of your calls, too. Don't forget the website. We put all this information there. TechGuyLabs.com. Uh, Joe says, 
We do not have access, Mint Mobile says, we do not have access to call content or text message content at all. Oh, our network provider, T-Mobile, assumedly has access for legal reasons, but we cannot inspect the content of the messages. So Mint Mobile is not the person to go to. T-Mobile is, but I don't know, you know, if because you're using an MVNO. It's a, a T-Mobile, sub, not subsidiary, but they buy their uh, buy traffic from T-Mobile. T-Mobile has a copy, but not Mint Mobile. But would T-Mobile give it to you because you're not a T-Mobile customer? Probably not. Thank you, Joe. That's that's very interesting. Hello, Chris. Hello. How are you? I'm today? good. You are off mic. Oh, I am? Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, oh, oh. You should be able to hear me. I can hear you, but through your laptop. Or whatever, some other microphone, not the one your, not the one your mouth is touching. Hold on. Yeah, SMS, unlike say um, WhatsApp, doesn't really have a backup system. Microphone, microphone, microphone. You're not hearing me through the microphone I'm talking to. No. Something weird. Hold on, hold on, hold on. As they say in the chat room, it sounds like you're down the hall in the bathroom. <laughs> is this better? There it is. Yay. All right. Yeah, you fix it. it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I. I just update it to Ventura. Maybe that's Oh, why. yeah, sure. Everything <laughs> got messed up. Everything got messed up. Hey, Benito, when you so, uh, when you put... Uh, uh, well, you're going to put Chris back there, but when you take him down, could you put a fire in the fireplace for me? I like having... It's so cold in here. I like to have a fire. So, Leo, you do have an email. Um, I have... A tiny little thing, not a goodbye thing, but I want to look at cameras from 2006 because that's when we met. Oh, how fun. Oh, how fun. I see it here. And I that'll put a, that, that'll tie a nice bow around tie everything. Tie a bow around it. Yes. All right. And, and, and Renee Silverman says hi and congratulations. I saw the email from her. I didn't realize she was a, a, quite an accomplished professional photographer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She is. Yeah. yeah that's cool. So, um, oh, yeah. One, yeah one, I guess one of the questions we should keep is, it going. Is the, yeah. Yeah. I don't, any reason to stop it. Yeah. One, one of the questions was what's going to happen to the Flickr group and that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's but, what I was saying. Let's keep that going. And then yeah. I'll send her an email. But perhaps what we should do is have you on once a month. Uh, to give us a new I'm assignment here. and a review. I'm happy. Would you like to do that? So that way, uh, totally. I can't do you weekly because because I have six regulars and only one two-hour show. Yeah, no worries. But uh, <laughs> it would be all regulars. But I think if we had you on once a month, how would that be? I could totally do that. I okay. could totally do that. Um, so let's plan on uh, doing that. I'll email you, but probably our first show is uh, January 8th. Let's plan on... Um, Maybe doing that on the fifteenth, which would be one month from to, from now. That would be cool. Yeah, I will email you, and if that works for you, and then you can give us an assignment and uh, and review it a month after that. So, like on the fifteenth, like halfway through every month, on the Ides of every month. <clears throat> are, are we talking similar timing? Uh, yeah, but it'd be Sundays. Or? Yeah, it'd be almost exactly the same time. Yeah. Or uh, earlier, totally we started, funny. we'll start at 11. Um, and actually, the beauty of this is you could do it pre recorded too, and we could drop it in. It's kind of up to you. Anyway, we'll yeah, talk. We'll, we'll, we'll talk figure it out. Yep. Is this from uh, Top Gun? Is this the, the, this is the love theme from Dirty Dancing? Yes. Yes. But you've had the time of your life. I have had the time of my life. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Professor Laura. <laughs> I confuse. What is the love theme from Top Gun? That's uh, similar, isn't it? <laughs> all these movie songs, they all sound the same, don't they? On we go with the calls. Bill in Galita, California is next. Hi, Bill. Hi, Leo. How are you doing? I'm this wonderful. On your last day. My last day. I get the gold watch tonight. They're going to have a little dinner for me. Uh, gold watch. And, and uh, signing up for Medicare tomorrow. 
No. Okay, well, I just got an email. My D-Link switches don't work anymore after the 30th. What? What do you recommend what? for you know, automation? Well, they're old. I've had them for quite a while. Oh, all right. So you're using them for home automation, you said? Well, you know, they turn the lights off. Oh, off. got it. I also have a camera that goes away, too. Because wow. I haven't been able to, they don't update them. So that's what you recommend. That stinks. So the first thing I would recommend is to look for a system, any kind of system, that has on the box, on the specs, support for matter. M-A-T-T-E-R. Matter is a new consortium of home automation with all the big players involved. And one of the reasons you want to go with Matter is so that it'll be interoperable no matter which hub or which device you buy. So you're not locking yourself into one manufacturer anymore. And that's nice. Within Matter, there are, of course, many choices. What do you, uh, what do you use for a phone? Do you, uh, how do you, an iPhone? And do you, and do you control the uh, lights, your D-Links right now with your iPhone or with your voice, or how do you control it? Yes, the iPhone, and you know, I don't really care about using Google to turn them off or on. Just the iPhone's handy, and then you can go and push them. Yeah. Them so Apple, is a, Apple participates in the Matter standard, uh, and of course they have their own, Apple has their own home automation um, uh, certification that you probably want to use because... Uh, I mean, it, it's a little bit more limiting. If you go to store.apple.com and you look in the home automation stuff, you'll see what they recommend. And it's stuff that they support. So, And then that way, your phone can be a hub, an iPad can be a hub, an Apple TV can be a hub. Uh, this locks you a little bit more into a more limited ecosystem, unfortunately, because you know you, you it's, now you're using the Apple standard. But I think a lot of people agree that that's a good standard because it's going to be secure... Uh, it's very likely that it will be around, unlike the D-Link stuff. So uh, they, it all, and it all starts with the Apple Home app. You can control lights. Uh, you can control uh, everything that you would control with home automation: your thermostat, garage doors, blinds, you know, ceiling fans. So I would, I would. That's you know a good place to look. I will tell you what uh, our home automation expert. Stacy Higginbotham says she's a big fan of Lutron, L-U-T-R-O-N switches. Um, they work with Matter. They work with Apple's HomeKit. So they're completely compatible. They also work with Amazon's Echo and uh, Google Voice if you do decide you want to use Voice. What about Wise? I like Wise, but <laughs> uh, Wise is very inexpensive. So... I, you know, actually, I would not hesitate to recommend Wise. They got in a little bit of trouble uh, because their first generation camera turned out to be insecure. And they said, we're not going to fix it because it's too old. It's kind of not so different from what you're going on with going on with your D-Link. It's too old. We don't want to support it anymore. I think Wise is actually a pretty good ecosystem. So this is the problem still with home automation. It's been this way for two decades. It's a Tower of Babel. It, everything is a different language. One thing doesn't talk to another. And so when you buy into one ecosystem, like the wise ecosystem, you're kind of, you're kind of, you know, you're, you're kind of committing into the wise. Uh, but I don't, but wise is very affordable. I think they're good people. Um, their smart home stuff has lighting. It has keys. It has a thermostat. It has even has a vacuum. They just added a vacuum cleaner. Um, so I, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't hesitate recommending uh, Wise. W Y Z E dot com. If you like Wise, the price sure is right. Um, and and it and I think it. I, I don't think it's matter, but uh, maybe that doesn't matter. Well, price is always a problem. Price is the big the big thing, isn't it? Yeah. Let's right. see if Wise is a member of the Matter Alliance. I don't know if it is. Matter support. I'm just checking that. Uh. Mm. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, Wise is not going to support the matter standard, at least uh -oh. as of now. That's not necessarily a problem. <laughs> um, well, as long as it works and I can turn the lights off. And yeah, you don't really care. It's really more for somebody who wants to build a giant castle of home automation. <laughs> You know, and they, yes. and, uh, and if you just want to turn lights on and off, you know, it's not as important. 
I my general advice to people going forward is to you know to kind of stick with matter, but because Wise is so less expensive, um, I you know I think it's probably safe safe to go to they go with. We have to pay for that privilege to use matter. Uh, oh, of course, and that's one of the reasons uh, it's less expensive is they don't go along with stuff like that. Let me see what Stacy said. If you have a matter device that needs thread, senior director of technology and services is wise. Said some ecosystem players. I don't know. I'll put a link to Stacy's article. What we know and don't know about matter. She does talk. She's a wise fan too, uh, and I will ask her. I'm gonna talk to her on Wednesday. I will ask her uh, what she thinks. Um. Uh, if if you're not if you're just doing lights, I guess, I guess it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, you know. Yeah, just and, lights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, go ahead and get Wise. I like Wise's stuff, and I think that they have learned. There, there was a minor issue. They, you know, people were upset because their cameras were insecure, and they said, "Well, you know, we're not going to fix it. Just get the new camera." And uh, th that was an upset for a lot of people. I was a little disappointed. I thought Wise could have done better with that. But uh, that's that's one that's just a small strike. Well, that's a yeah. one yellow card. They're they're okay still. They're they're okay in my book. Well, have a good Saturday. Thank you. You too. It's Sunday, but I did have a good Saturday. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's confusing. We had football yesterday. It was very confusing, but uh, it is Sunday. <laughs> we will continue. You know what? If it's Sunday, it must be Chris Marquardt, our photo guy. Coming up in just a little bit. He wants to take, this is going to be fun. He wants to take a trip down memory lane. Chris and I have known each other and been working together since the mid-aughts. And he's been doing a, a, a podcast, a photography podcast, Tips from the Top Floor, since about then. And he's been on this show for as, practically as long as we've done it. So Chris and I, a trip down memory lane, the cameras of yesteryear. <laughs> Next on The Tech Guy Show. First episode's January 8th. Chris? January, January 8th. 8th. Yeah. But we could, I think we'll talk to you on the 15th. Let's make that... Let's. I don't want to get you on the first show. It's going to be a perfect. mess. It's going to be a mess. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm totally fine. 15th, give me, give me time. Uh, I don't know yet. We'll do yet. the first um, one live and then we'll see. I'll say... I'll say um, let's make it the same time, 1230. All right. And, uh, Good with me. That's perfect. Hey, everybody. Leo Laporte here. I am the founder and one of the hosts at the Twit Podcast Network. I want to talk to you a little bit about what we do here at Twit because I think it's unique. And I think for anybody who is uh, bringing a product or a service to a tech audience, you need to know about what we do here at Twit. We've built an amazing audience of engaged, intelligent, affluent listeners who listen to us and trust us when we recommend a product. Our mission statement is to, is to build a highly engaged community of tech enthusiasts. Boy, already you should be, your ears should be perking up at that because highly engaged is good for you. Tech enthusiasts, if that's who you're looking for, this is the place. We do it by offering them the knowledge they need to understand and use technology in today's world. And I hear from our audience all the time, Part of that knowledge comes from our advertisers. We are very careful. We pick advertisers with great products, great services, with integrity, and introduce them to our audience with authenticity uh, and genuine enthusiasm. And that makes our host red ads different from anything else you can buy. We are literally bringing you to the attention of our audience and giving you a big, fat endorsement. We like to create partnerships with trusted brands, brands who are in it for the long run, long-term partners that want to grow with us. And we have so many great success stories. Tim Broom, who founded IT Pro TV in 2013, started advertising with us on day one, has been with us ever since. He said, quote, we would not be where we are today without the Twit Network. I think the proof is in the pudding. Advertisers like IT Pro TV and Audible that have been with us for more than 10 years. They stick around because their ads work. And honestly, isn't that why you're buying advertising? You get a lot with Twit. We have a very full service attitude. We almost think of it as kind of artisanal uh, advertising, boutique 
advertising. You'll get a full service continuity team. People who are on the phone with you, who are in touch with you, who support you from with everything from copywriting to graphic design. So you are not alone in this. We embed our ads into the shows. They're not they're not added later. They're part of the shows. In fact, often they're such a part of our shows that our other hosts will chime in on the ad saying, yeah, I love that. Or just the other day, one of our hosts said, man, I really got to buy that. <laughs> That's an additional benefit to you because you're hearing people, our audience trusts saying, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, we deliver, always over deliver on impressions. So you know, you're going to get the impressions you expect. The ads are unique every time. We don't pre-record them and roll them in. We are genuinely doing those ads in the middle of the show. Uh, we'll give you great onboarding services. Ad tech with pod sites that's free for direct clients. Gives you a lot of reporting. Gives you a great idea of how well your ads are working. You'll get courtesy commercials. You actually can take our ads and share them across social media and landing pages. That really extends the reach. There are other free goodies too, including mentions in our weekly newsletter that's sent to thousands of fans engaged fans who really want to see this stuff. We give you bonus ads and social media promotion too. So if you want to be a long-term partner, introduce your product to a savvy, engaged tech audience. Visit twit.tv slash advertise. Check out those testimonials. Mark McCrary is the CEO of Authentic. You probably know him, one of the biggest uh, original podcast advertising companies. We've been with him for 16 years. Mark said the feedback from many advertisers over 16 years across a range of product categories, everything from razors to computers, is that if ads and podcasts are going to work for a brand, they're going to work on Twitch shows. I'm very proud of what we do because it's honest, it's got integrity, it's authentic, and it really is a great introduction to our audience of your brand. Our listeners are smart, they're engaged, they're tech savvy. They're dedicated to our network. And that's one of the reasons we only work with high integrity partners that we've personally and thoroughly vetted. I have absolute approval on everybody. If you've got a great product, I want to hear from you. Elevate your brand by reaching out today at advertise at twit.tv. Break out of the advertising norm. Grow your brand with host red ads on twit.tv. Visit twit.tv slash advertise for more details. Or you can email us advertise at twit.tv. Dot TV if you're ready to launch your campaign now. I can't wait to see your product. So give us a ring. It's time to talk photography with Mr. Chris Marquardt, professional photographer and longtime photographic podcaster. His lovely expeditions are at discoverthetopfloor.com, discoverthetopfloor.com. And he has been joining us every week for some time to talk about <laughs> photography. Some time. Yeah, yeah, you could say that. How you long? That. I don't know. How long? It's been 16 years. What? I, I've looked it up in uh, in a 2006. That's when we holy cow first time ran into each other for the first time, and um, I thought, why not look at the cameras from 2006 and see oh. like how things have changed, maybe or maybe not. Um, so I brought five, three still cameras and two more video related ones. One you will well probably recognize all of them, but one has a very special place. So uh, let's start with the uh, Nikon D80. Um, again, came out in 2006. I had a D70. Uh, and uh, boy, I love that camera. That was my probably my first digital SLR. An in-body focus motor, which is something that Nikon had back then. Um, so the, the autofocus lenses would, would be powered by a motor mm -hmm. in, the, in the camera body. <laughs> yeah. Um, 10 megapixel CCD. So 10 megapixels kind of was a bit of the standard back then. Um, it could do multiple exposures in camera. So had a bit of uh, a, a trickery function in there, so to speak. USB 2.0 high speed. That was pretty cool back then. Um, and a 230,000 pixel LCD on the back, two and a half nice. inches. Fairly tiny. Use those um, uh, big compact flash cards for memory. And the, it only yes. adds one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the first one. Second one that um, I 
found interesting was to come because I was I was firmly in the Canon camp. Oh, that's funny because I was uh, I was still Nikon. I moved to Canon later, but I was still, <laughs> that's why I had a D seventy. Yeah, yeah. So 400D here in Europe in the U.S. Digital Rebel XT. Oh. Again, we're talking 10 megapixel. The um, Rebels Canon were was, huge. This was the big popularizing camera. Uh, they advertised it. Remember, they were advertising it. Uh, who was it? Uh, some some tennis player uh, was advertised. Would take pictures with it, and they were advertised. Oh, there's a great action camera. This this the, and yeah. it was inexpensive. The Rebel was the, I think, the camera that pushed a whole bunch of people into digital. Very yeah. very important. This is also this is also the camera that introduced the sensor cleaning system, like where they had the the sensor wiggling back and forth, very high frequency to shake off dust and that kind of stuff. Nine point autofocus, and today's cameras they have like every pixel is an autofocus pixel. But um, yeah, that was and you could tell this was a consumer interesting camera because it still had a flash built in. <laughs> the one that would pop up at the worst time possible. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, another system that was introduced back then in 2006 was the Sony Alpha system. The really? Total, the entire system. They they had bought Minolta's camera um, company, camera parts in early 2006. And then, yeah, they introduced the Alpha system. I did which not has... realize this. I am a now a Sony Alpha shooter, but I didn't realize that they got into this yes. so early. Was this also mirrorless? Um, the, I think the, the initial ones were DSLRs. They, they, uh, went mirrorless, like the next system, the Sony next system came out in 2010, I think. Oh, that's so, right. The uh, but that yeah, was the yeah. early, yeah. the yeah. early ones here. Yeah. All right. So that's the still cameras on the video side, because these cameras didn't shoot video, right? These were right. now, now every camera does everything, but these cameras were strictly still cameras. Um, I think the first DSLR that actually added video was later, which was the D90 by Nikon. They were the first ones to kind of give you a proper big sensor, an APS-C sensor, but a proper bigger sensor um, with video. But there was another camera that came out in 2006, which is this one. Do you remember the oh, flip? Oh, the flip. Camera? I had a flip. You know, that was such a success. Everybody had flips. They were doing video blogging and and it just it just died. It just died suddenly, like they yep. just disappeared. It just, but wasn't I? I mean, so so the thing is, the early flips shot uh, VGA, yeah. six hundred forty by four hundred eighty. It, it actually really didn't look so different from a camera one. phone, and I guess that's really what killed the flip. Is once the iPhone came out and people could use their phone to do this, nobody was going to buy a right. separate device. But it it brought it brought H two sixty four compression MP four files. Yeah. Um, it brought this this ingenious flip out USB plug. So you, that's why they call them flip. You could flip out a USB plug and just plug it straight into your computer and download the files. And up to that point, I think most of the others were a bit more convoluted, and you had to use their software and convert stuff and so on. And this was pretty much ready to put on the computer. Boy, so. that that is an example of a flash in the pan product, right? Just it just disappeared. But what a, what a flash in the pan! They it were really huge. good for a very short while. Yeah, yeah. So last but not least, and this <laughs> this is this is a special device because that's the device that brought us together. I have it still. The Nokia N ninety three. So. He, this this has a this has a 3.2 megapixel camera. It's a phone, but it's also a camera. It has three times optical zoom, unheard of in a Nokia device up to that point. A Carl Zeiss lens built in. You interviewed um, me with one of these. Well, so the thing is, back then when they introduced it, they introduced that in in Europe first, <laughs> and it wasn't out in the states yet. And it's funny because uh, it has a, us, we, it has a screen on one side and a mirror yes. on the other side, so the person you're oh. talking to can see themselves. <laughs> so, so, so the the two of us were both at the at the podcast, podcast expo, expo in California. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was there. I was actually sponsored by Nokia to bring this to, to shoot video with this phone at the podcast expo. And the the interesting thing is that it was even possible to edit video on that device. Uh, we're talking 2006. That's one year before the iPhone. So, so that's the key. Because um, as soon as the iPhone came out, both the Flip and this just died. Oh, they were gone. <laughs> 
they were gone. <laughs> they were gone. I mean, this, so like this that. was a phone. You know, it was like a flip phone. But then it had a like a video camera on it. What a crazy device. So I've, I remember trying to convince the device because so I, I wanted to produce the entire thing on this phone. So that was an intro video. Wait a minute. The actual Mine still has a I memory did. card in here. What do you think's on this one gigabyte oh. memory card? <laughs> Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> it's mini SD. I don't think I have anything I can uh, I can connect it to. <laughs> How funny. Wow. So it was it was it was it was an interesting exercise to shoehorn this thing into being able to edit a show together with an yeah. intro, a bit, an outro. Did you do that? Did device. you edit? I did, and I uploaded that from the device to a server where it was then taken care of. But just just finding out what video format to put on there for the <laughs> intro and the outro, I was on the phone with a with a Nokia engineer <laughs> trying to figure that out. So it was it was an adventure. A it Carl was an adventure. Zeiss especially lens yeah. 3x octopus. Especially looking at how simple all this is now, yeah. 16 years later, but that was kind of the beginnings of the mobile video production wow thing. Wow. There we go. Now now I I didn't I, you know it's funny I should go through all my old stuff. I have a museum behind me. I didn't realize there was a memory <laughs> card in here. This is going to be memories. Maybe there'll be pictures of you from 2000s. No, I didn't have this yet. I so bought it because I you bought were, it because of you. You, want, you wanted one. <laughs> I said, "Where did, where did you get that amazing toy? I must have it." Yeah. Uh and then yes. the iPhone came out a year later and everything disappeared. It became everything a changed, slab yeah. of black glass. And that's that's history. Chris uh, is going to continue on with us, as I think are most of our regulars on the new Ask the Tech Guys show. I've even booked him for uh, January 15th because we yes. need our assignments. So assignments will begin again. Take the holidays <laughs> off. Enjoy your fish holidays. Back. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't sell the fishbowl. Uh, no, and we will see it. you in a month. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Discover the top floor so much. More calls after this. This is hysterical. Now I got to figure out. I think I could just use the phone as a as a card reader, probably, right? Uh, if you find a plug that fits the phone, oh, it is has it USB? USB, right? Doesn't it? No, I no, don't think. No, so. it's proprietary. Uh, no, it's got a proprietary oh, thing. Dang it! I, gotta, uh, I might have to buy a mini SD card reader because there's got to be something <laughs> on here. I wonder if I'm, that's you can send it into a data rescue company. Yeah. Well, I should really go through all this old stuff because I, you know, I, you know, I do this with film cameras. I I buy used old film cameras, and then sometimes there's still film in there. So, um, I had this. I had film from like seventy years ago in a camera once. Oh, look! Here's an all-in-one USB three card reader, plug-and-play, Apple Windows compatible USB supports CF, SD, SDHC, SDXC, MMC, MMC Micro. <laughs> I think it'll support this. Yeah. It'll do it. Three but do you really tomorrow. want to see what's on there? I think I do. Is that crazy? <laughs> no, it's not. Of course not. I have no idea though. 2006. What could be on here? I still, I still have a couple of eight megabyte CF cards, so I should probably <laughs> check if there's something on them. Eight this is, megabytes. This is the original card because it says Nokia on it. So this is the one that came there with the uh, the phone. Wow. Wow. Chris, what a pleasure. It's been a great long run. Uh, Thank you so much for, for making that possible. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to the new thing. Yeah. It'll be a lot and, of fun. Uh, and uh, happy holidays. You too. Have a great Christmas. And a happy new year. And I'll see you next year. All right. Take care. All right. Bye, Chris. So this... Um, no, this is not a standard SD card. This is some weird mini SD. But do you think it would... I need a mini SD to SD to read it in a card reader, right? But I think I found one. I'm going to buy it right now. It says mini SD, the Smart Q. It's only 18 bucks, And it reads everything including mini SD. So I'm just dying to know if there's anything on here. Uh, I can't turn on the phone because I can't power it because it has a non-standard connector. That's one of the things that changed. 
uh, was we finally uh, got standardized connectors. This this has this weird connector. What's that though? That might be a power connector. Actually, maybe that's this might be data. I bet that's data. That's probably RS two two thirty two or something. And then th this this looks like a little tiny power plug. The problem is I don't sure I don't have the. That's hysterical. Now that's not my attitude at all. In fact, I think perhaps when I called the boss five months ago to uh, tell her I was leaving, I think there were tears shed on both sides. No, you told him shove it. I did not say take this job and shove it. I did not. I did not. In fact. Uh, I wasn't thinking it either. It was a hard decision to make. I love doing this. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And you know what? I, I think I'm much reassured by the fact that uh, Rich Tomorrow's taken over. I mean, that's that's exactly the way it should be. The young, good-looking guy take, <laughs> taking over. Ed's on the line from uh, Indian Trail, North Carolina. Hi, Ed. How are you today? Uh, I am very well, my friend. How are you? Oh, I'm I'm pretty good. I'd like to say first of all, I've enjoyed your show over the years, and I my big regret is that I never listened to it more. I'd always turn it on somewhere in the middle, you know, in the car, and say, "Oh, I see, I an hour see, and... you should have listened for all three hours every weekend." <laughs> now let me ask you this question: When you miss shows because we get preempted with basketball sure. games and other stuff, I still do them down here stuff. So how do we um? How do we catch up or catch up on... So here's the good news. Every show I have done, all 1,954 of them are on the website, techguylabs.com. And you can go back in time. And if you missed a show because of because of an exciting basketball game, and I hear you have a few in North Carolina, uh, no problem. You can uh, go back and listen. And uh, in fact, don't tell the boss, but we even cut the ads out. So it's a uh, it's two hours instead of three. So it's a little, it's a quick quick listen, and a number of podcast players will let you play it back at twice the speed. So then it's only uh, an hour, so you could catch up quickly. And as I mentioned, we're going to continue to do podcasts. So we've this is actually this show was my first podcast back in two thousand four. Podcasting just got started in fall of two thousand four. I was always putting the shows up online on a website, techguylabs.com, as it turns out. But uh, it wasn't a podcast until uh, a, a young guy named Matt Bischoff, I think he was 14 or 15, called. And Matt, I'll never forget it. He said, hey, when are you going to do a podcast with this show? And I said, what, what's a podcast, Matt? And he explained it, and I did it. And that was our first podcast back in uh, October 2004. So we have them all. You will never miss a show. And, in fact, we're going to add to that stack starting with 1956, uh, January 8th. So the, the numbers will continue to grow. As long as I, as long as I don't fall off this chair, I'll be here. Okay, I, I have a question, and sure. I don't know if this is a simple answer or not. Okay, uh, I have some old VHS tapes that they're not convenient to watch. Of course not. So I wanted to yeah. have a program to convert it to a DVD, and this way, if you want to go to the beach and take a player or whatever you want to do, it's more convenient. You can't be dragging a VHS player. But some of these programs, uh, some of these uh, shows may not be uh, recordable, or uh, re you know what I'm saying, transferred so, from so, VHS. Yeah, let me let me exp This is well worth doing because those tapes are magnetic tapes, and they're degrading over time. And at some point, the ferrous material that's stuck onto the mylar on that tape, of on all reel to reel tapes and VHS tapes, it's the same. Will start flaking off, and they will be unplayable. So now is the time. If you want to save them, now is the time to save them. They're stored on that tape in an analog form. And as you may know already, uh, your computer, your player, your phone, they need digital. They need ones and zeros. So you have the thing you're going to get is an analog to digital converter. Now there are, and there, there continue to be, they're very expensive now. They used to be less expensive. Machines that take a VHS tape on one side... And a DVD, recordable DVD on the other side. <laughs> you press play, and it would just record it to a DVD. That's the easiest. Amazon still sells them, but I see it's around 600 bucks. So I don't think that's the best way to do it. The other way, it sounds like you still have a VCR. 
I ha- I do, but it's just more like for kind of reviewing or. Yeah, yeah. well, if you have it, you can use it. You you have to play it back. So you put the tape in. You play it back. As long as you can play it back, you can record it. The back of the VCR has those connections for the TV, the red, the white, and the yellow, or red, black, and yellow connections for the TV, right? So those connections, yeah, well, I, you hook up to your... I to, have, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, don't mean, um, I don't mean a regular VHS tape. I mean one that when you put it in, it might say something like, this isn't recordable, or this isn't... Uh, you can't copy it or I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You know. So there is copy protection mm-hmm. on commercial VHSs. So if you went, <laughs> you could do it now. If you, if you find a, uh, an old blockbuster going out of business, there's actually only one left in the country up in Oregon. But if you find an old, if there's one in, that's been here for years, just a couple of years ago, had the $1 sale where they got rid of all their tapes. So let's say you stocked up on commercial VHS tapes, movies, things like right. that, right? Right. Yeah, uh, right. You can convert those, but they are protected with a technology called macro vision. So you need something that will remove the macro vision. I will be honest right. with you. By the time you buy that and then buy the box that you're going to need that's going to take the analog and convert it to bits and record it on your computer, you'd be much better off just buy, <laughs> buying it on Apple's iTunes or Prime Video or or uh, one of the one of the services buy a downloadable copy the the quality is going to be better it's going to end up costing you less cuz you're not buying all this equipment and it's certainly a a lot less of a, a headache the result you're going to get converting these is not ideal but you do need you do need something that's going to take the macro vision protected VHS tape and and remove the protection um, that might be a little harder to find because it's technically illegal. You know, for as long as I've been doing this show, this has been always the quandary. The Copyright Act says you cannot reverse engineer copy protection. It's not allowed. And you can, you certainly can't sell a product that does that. But you can't even, if you knew about it, you can't even tell anybody how to do it. You They just don't want anybody to... To, to tell you. You can figure out how to do it on your own, and as long as you don't tell anybody, it's not illegal. I think there is a difference between this, the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law, of course, is to prevent you from taking that one tape you have of dirty dancing and making a thousand copies of it, spreading a blanket on your lawn and selling it. They don't want you to do that. In my opinion, and I would imagine any sensible court, but I can't guarantee you, I'm not a lawyer, if you're making a copy of a tape you purchased because that tape is falling apart and won't last forever and you want to put it in another form, no one's being harmed. You bought that movie. You're not reselling it. You're not putting it up on the internet. You're not. You're just doing it yourself. In, in my non-official, non-legal opinion, that's fine. Uh, and, and I can't imagine that the copyright police are going to come to your door and say to you, how dare you? So I think you're all right. But in order to do this, you have to buy a product that is illegal, that is removing the copy protection. So you're not going to just be able to look on Amazon for macro buster <laughs> or something like that. Uh, you might have to do a little digging. I, I think, honestly, by the time you get through this, you'd be much better off just getting the movie uh, in a digital format. You can buy it. You could buy it as a DVD if you really had to. I think nowadays, this is, you know, I, I've tell this story, and I'll, this will be the last time I'll ever tell this story, but I have a good friend who loved Cheers. He loved Cheers more than anything. It was his favorite show. Recorded everyone on VHS, dutifully set his recorder, recorded. He had a closet full of VHS tapes, every Cheers episode. Flash forward to today, you can watch them all on Netflix, and it's much higher. It's HD quality. Much higher quality than that VHS. And because it's on Netflix, all you need is a Netflix subscription. It's. It, I think we've gone past that age now where you want a physical copy of something. There are still, unfortunately, there are still movies that are not digitized. Uh, so that would be the one time you'd want to do that. But you have to, you have to ask yourself, is it worth spending a few hundred dollars on hardware to do this, hours and hours of your time to get a low-quality copy of that movie. If it is, that's how you do it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, I 
I will be saying shove it when I leave. Take this job and shove it. I ain't working here. No, I, I called him. Uh, I, I actually, uh, I sent Julia an email saying, can we talk tomorrow morning at 9 a.m.? She said, uh-oh. <laughs> uh, and I said, you know, I, I hate to do this, but I think the time has come. The contract required me to give him 120 days notice. I think I gave him more than that. I gave him 150 days because I didn't want them to, you know, be well in advance because they have to sell ads. They have to tell the stations. They have to find a place. There's a lot of work to do. So I wanted to give them. The minute I, I I decided I was up in the air about it, but the minute I decided, I, I called her, told him because I don't I didn't want him to. So you know, there are some who think I was fired, and I can prove that that's not the case. Because what happens when you're fired from a job? Do they let you stay on the job for months at a time with a microphone? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're not they're not gonna uh, let you on the air if they fire you ever again so this was absolutely my choice well hey 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 how are you today Leo Laporte here the tech guy last hour of the tech guy show 8888 ask Leo the last chance to call please give me a ring I'd love to hear from you 888-827-5536 toll free from anywhere in the US or Canada uh, outside that area, Portugal, for instance, you can use uh, Skype out or some sort of voice over internet to call. should be free. The website, and do keep this in mind, is techguylabs.com. We want you to keep that uh, because we will put links up there from uh, you know, things that we talk about on the show. But all the shows are there. 1,954 episodes. They're all there as a podcast, audio and video. We put transcriptions up now, which is a great way to search for something you're looking for. And as I said, all the links, Professor Laura's music playlist, all of that stuff, techguylabs.com. It's free. There's no sign up. I don't want your email. There's no money. I don't want your money. Uh, it's there as a service for you. So uh, please take advantage of that, techguylabs.com. And starting... Uh, in the new year, that'll be the place to find the new internet-only version of the Tech Guy. We're calling it Ask the Tech Guys. It'll be two of us, Micah Sargent and I, answering your questions. Uh, it'll be a little bit of a looser format because, uh, you know, there's no radio clock to adhere to. A little more relaxed. Uh, and we will continue to take calls. I think we're going to use Zoom for a lot of them. We'd love to be able to see you. Uh, but we will make it possible just to use your phone so you don't have to be seen if you don't want to. And many of our uh, regulars uh, will appear on uh, that show. Chris Marquardt, uh, Sam Abul Samad, Scott Wilkinson, uh, and I hope Rod Pyle, our space guy who's wearing a funny hat right now, will be joining us soon. <laughs> you can take the hat off for a while, Rod. you got a little time. Back to the phones we go. <laughs> it doesn't look that comfortable. Josh, I'm sorry, Joel on the line from Sacramento, California. Hi, Joel. Hello, Leo. It is it is really nice to get to talk to you. I've driven by Petaluma, but I've never stopped in. And uh, that's a story I hear a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it, you know, and really, I, got, I think I speak for a lot of people saying we really respect what you've done for, through the years. Thank uh, you, both with with the radio show, and and I and if if people who are listening on the radio right now have not tuned into your This Week in Tech podcast a network. Uh, I, I listen regularly to your programs, Thank Mac, you. like Security Now, Twit, Windows Weekly, excellent podcast with the most knowledgeable people you can find, journalists on a subject. So thank you, and wow. you're going to continue to do that for some time. I did not pay him for this, folks. I No, no, no. <laughs> thank you, Joel. I appreciate it. That's very kind of you. Yeah. Thank you. But, 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 you know, I really am going to miss this radio program. Because, and I've talked to other people about this too. It is very different from Twit because you're talking it is. to people, yeah, people who who maybe aren't experts in a technical subject, and you're helping them. Yeah, and it, I have learned a lot on how to help just the average people, how to help your mom, your dad, the the people you work with with technical problems. And so I wanted to ask you this: You've been doing this for years, uh, decades. What are some gems that we can learn? We're all somebody's tech guy or tech gal. How do you patiently, helpfully help somebody uh, when they've got a tech problem? It's challenging, especially, uh, and I'm going to assume, Joel, you're, you're a geek. 
for us geeks, the people that people go to to say, well, how does this work? It's very hard to be patient because we get it. We understand it. And it's often the case that we mm -hmm. want to say, well, you just, what are you talking about? You see right there, you press that and it will work. And it's hard for us to remember that I don't know what it is. I've often wondered this. Is it a gene? Is it, a, is it like math ability that just some people have it, some people don't? I don't think that it is. I think technology anybody can use, but some of us, I think really comes down to whether we enjoy it or not. So those of us who really like it and are interested in it, uh, spend the time perhaps unconsciously to learn it. And mm. those who aren't gravitating towards it, who don't find it exciting, you know, if you love, well, we just had the World Cup final today. If you love the beautiful sport, football, soccer, uh, you maybe have an appreciation for what goes on the field more than I do as somebody who is not a soccer fan. Mm -hmm. To me, it looks like they're just running back and forth for hours for no reason. So I think that that's kind of, that's the analogy I would make that, you know, there are those of us who get it and the, and then many who don't. The hardest thing in the world is for, for those of us who get it, have sympathy or understanding for those who don't. So remember, they're not dumb, number one. Uh, this I, and I only know this because it's hard for me to remember it too, and my wife will testify to that. <laughs> <She'll say. laughs> there's, there's countless ways they're going to be superior to us. In exactly. Experience. Yes. Uh, yeah. Just uh, you know, when I ask her, "Is this magenta or purple?" and she says, "What are you talking about?" Same thing, right? She gets it. I don't. So, and actually, she's very good with technology. I shouldn't use her as an example, but you you get the idea. There are people in your life who just they it's not it's not their thing. They're not dumb. They just have a different way of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to understand how to communicate to them without, A, sounding like you're talking to a five-year-old. Okay, honey, let me, let me explain this to you. It's a little hard for you, isn't it? So I always try to, you probably, you, this is certainly how I've done the radio shows. I always try to remember this person is, is, is a smart, and I even sometimes say it out loud, you're smart, you can do this. They're smart, they're intelligent, it's not that. Yeah. It's not that. They're just not soccer fans, you know? Uh, so so that's the first thing to remember. Um, the other thing is uh, I, I double down on my enthusiasm for the subject. I love it so much, and I think that's probably what made me good at this, that in my downtime, I read manuals. I try stuff. I, 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 I spend a lot of time working with technology, and that helps because uh, I have a you know much broader experience. If you're one of those people, you know your experience will help you a lot. The final thing, the most important thing, and I think you probably know I do this. If you don't know, say you don't know, because <laughs> the worst thing you can do is say, "Oh yeah, uh, I, I know that." As you flip through the manual real quickly, uh, you're much more likely to give them bad advice than good advice in that case. So it's okay to say your doctor to do that. Yeah, you don't want your doctor to say, "Oh yeah, I know what's wrong with yeah. you, buddy." No, if you don't know, say you don't know. There's no shame in that. Uh, and then that's a great opportunity to take somebody and say, well, let's figure this out together and kind of give them maybe some skills in future. The worst thing, and I see this all the time, and I'm often tempted to do it, there's a website called Let Me Google That For You, where you can enter. In a, <laughs> if somebody asks you something and you know, look, it's one Google search away from the, the answers. One, you just you people will often go to let me Google that for you, enter in that address and send it to them. And it's the worst thing you can do. Don't do that. <laughs> it's tempting. It's funny, but don't do that. <laughs> well, I think we glean, I think I gleaned from this to summarize, stay enthusiastic, make it fun rather than a problem. Yes, that's right. Cause it is for us. It's it is fun. for us. It's, like it's not for them. It's annoying to them. Yeah. Yeah. Listen to them. Don't be condescending. That and, and it makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you, Leo. Oh, I'm glad you asked. That's a great. It's a great question, and I am very gl grateful that you've been listening all this time, Joel. And I hope we'll see you on the uh, on the podcast side going forward. Will do. Thank Look you. TechGuyLabs.com. It's going to keep working. It doesn't stop. Uh, 8888 Ask Leo will stop working. Rich Tomorrow taking over the show starting January 7th. He will have his own phone number. <laughs> we talked to him yesterday. He said, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's something like 8888-ASK-RICH. Probably not that, but uh, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to tune in January 7th and find out. How about that? As will I. Uh, our spaceman, Rod Pyle, coming up in 15. More of your calls right after this.
Uh, I'll find it. I can find it. It's in a different bin, right? Uh, I just op I do the open thing. Check the bins. Oh, there's a sound side. Oh. Hollywood Sunset. Incentafez. Simplify Audio. Okay. Is it, in, is it in the Dropbox? Oh, I should go back to that bin. Uh, no? Doesn't matter? Okay. Right, let me let me get out of this whole... Oh, there it is. For Leo from Rod. That? <laughs> Rod took off the hat. Now he's just wearing the lights. What's wrong with you, dude? I, I, I My headphones kept falling off. And, you know, I was trying to look festive, but I think I look more like you a bad like, prop. You looked like Abe Lost Lincoln. Space. You looked like yeah. Abe Lincoln. I don't know what the hell you <laughs> yes. were doing. I don't know. It was it's festive. supposed to be festive. Here, now I just look like a short circuit. So this is, uh, it's two minutes, two two minutes and 58 seconds. You don't want me to yeah, play this long. in the show, do you? No, no, no. Besides, the lyrics are really hard to understand, unfortunately. Hey, who wrote this? I commissioned it. Aww. I sent you a lyric sheet. Aww. Where do you get something like this made? Songglorious.com. They do nice work. Bless you, sweet. And by the way, thank you. Aww. You make me cry. You should make me cry. That's me. <laughs> Sorry. To bring talent to radio and make the best content for So nice, Rod. Thank you. Oh, you bet. Yeah, it's long. <laughs> well, you 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 got the deluxe package. Yeah. Problems such as Windows existence. For these amazing years. And this next chapter in your life would be so special to Not dead yet. Goodbye, tech guy. Thanks for all you do. And the radio has been so lucky to have you, Leo Laporte, our cyber hero. I've loved our shows together. Why do you do <laughs> that? That's yeah. really sweet. You deserve it. Oh, we'll post this. You earned it. I'll post oh, cool. it. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. really yeah, sweet. they gave us they gave us permission. Oh, that's so nice. And I have a song for you. Uh oh. <laughs> I'll bet I know what it is. <laughs> You've heard it before. You've heard it before. All right. Stay tuned. <laughs> now it's you shouldn't that's not I'm not gonna cry, so don't even don't even attempt. Don't even attempt it. Leo Laporte, your tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo. They're trying. They're trying. I think it's a game they play. Steve's on the line from uh, Valinda, California. Hello, Steve. Yes. Hey, Leo. Welcome to the show. What's up? Yes, thank you. Uh, Long-time listener, first-time caller, believe it or not, and I've been listening to you probably for the past uh, 15 years. Wow. Um, I have visited you at the brick house with my two kids and wife so oh nice person two times yeah i hope i was i hope i was pleasant <laughs> yes very no very oh, good very personable and it was it was a pleasure meeting you and thank you i'm just i had to call for this special day today thank you yeah brick house was our old uh, beautiful studio in downtown petaluma which 
we got uh, evicted from because they uh, they sold it and the new owners wanted to triple the rent. And we said, well, maybe not. We moved to a less expensive, but I think a very nice little studio on the east side. Turned out those new owners uh, were scammers and the building is now in federal receivership and the owner is doing hard time for $300 million Ponzi scheme. So um, oh, I think we would <laughs> we would have been forced out one way or the other anyway. So I'm glad we moved. Uh, yeah, that was a, that was too bad because we loved that was a beautiful studio, really amazing, beautiful, beautiful yeah. neighborhood. We've even talked about maybe in the future when we retire to move up to Petaluma. Yeah, neighborhood. we love it. Yeah, and yeah, we hope uh, hopefully yeah we'll get a chance uh, when you open your we open your doors get a chance to see the new. That'd studio. be nice, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. We're not uh, not yet. In fact, we just closed them down a little bit more because everybody's getting yeah. sick, and uh, I don't want to get the flu for Christmas. So we uh, no no. <laughs> I'm in my hermetically sealed studio, which we uh, oh. every morning John comes in here with a bunch of sage and uh, and uh, dis <laughs> disinfects it by burning sage and saying out spirits out. And I don't think that works, but it's you know it's worth a try. Steve, did you, did you have a question you wanted to ask about? Yes. Besides, like I said, calling the special day and wanting to, you know, at least, thank you. You know, thank you. Talk over the it. good old fashioned, good old uh, was it pots? The plain old telephone line and pots. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. Uh, yep. Yep. Uh, I just the, the main question was just uh, this. I have a Galaxy Samsung Ultra Twenty Two, also known as the Note Twenty Two. I love that. Uh, it's a beautiful yeah. phone. Yeah, I was a Note fan from day one. Uh, disappointed they could discontinued it, but the, they might as well because these new Galaxy phones are just as big. So. What do you need a note for? I love that S22. Nice phone. Beautiful. The only thing is that I wanted to see there's a workaround as far as getting timestamps. Because if I have the phone off or let's say I'm airplane mode, I like to know when I received a certain text or like yeah. a phone call. I know with Google Voice, you're able to do that. It just wasn't completely satisfied with that. So I wanted to see if there's a workaround or, or some way in the settings where you can receive those timestamps regardless if the phone was off or, or charging. Or so I'm airplane. looking at, I have a... Uh, I have a Pixel 7 phone, and I'm using uh, Google's messages, the Android messages, and I see a timestamp on the right uh, for my messages. So, mm -hmm. uh, and they are at the top of the message. So, what are, you must be using the Samsung, the Samsung uh, app for messages. Yes. Right. Um, yeah, I'm using the, the stock, whatever is a stock. Yeah. So I thought Samsung changed with the S22 to using the Google, and it, it's confusing because it's called messages. Both of them are messages. There's Samsung messages and there's Google messages. So it's kind of confusing as to which one you're using. But if you go into the settings on your phone and you look at default mm -hmm. apps, you can see which you're using for SMS. And you want to use the Google messages, even though it doesn't say Google messages, as opposed to the Samsung messages. I would think Samsung's messages would have that. But I, the only reason I'm saying this is because I am using Google messages and I do see timestamps on every on everyone. There's actually a cool thing on the um, on the iPhone. I didn't know about it. I think it was uh, uh, it was probably um, uh, I'm guessing it was Micah who showed me, but you can uh, you can if you want to see timestamps from uh, let's see who should I who should I call show? I don't want to show anything too personal. How about this? You can slide it over to the right. This is a wild thing that I didn't even know about. There is a menu command to show timestamps, but you can also just drag to the right, and you'll see the gutter will open up on Apple's messages and show you timestamps for everything. So that's another uh, on an iPhone how to do it. But on your Go on your Galaxy, I think if you're using Google Messages, it's just there. It'd be my guess. That's worth, right. worth a try. The only difference, as far as I can tell, between <laughs> Samsung's and Google's is that the Google icon is blue and the Samsung icon is green. Right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just, it's very similar. So maybe just try. Make sure you're using the Google. I think the Google one's better for a variety of of reasons. Um, right. Uh, I would just just make sure you're using the Google one. And I do see on the Google one, I am seeing timestamps uh, all the way across the board. So. Uh, yeah, that's something you want, and it's not when it came in. It it is it is. I mean, it's not when you opened it. It's literally when it when it came in. Steve, come up and visit us in the new studio as soon as we reopen. I'll let you know. Maybe you could sit in on a uh, Ask the Tech Guys show, our new show, starting next year. Spencer Astro Nerd on the line from Charlotte, North Carolina. Hello, Astro Nerd. 
How you doing there, Leo? <laughs> I am great. Um, Did you see that? Was it the Pleiades this uh, this week? The Pleiades. Pleiades was that the? Uh, there was a beautiful. Uh, uh, you're uh, talking about the uh, uh, meteor shower? Yeah. What was no, it? I didn't get to see that meteor shower because oh. it was cloudy here. Oh, it was a it was a beautiful one. I'm told, maybe the best of the year. Yes. Oh but, well. Uh, uh, a very good meteor shower at this time of year. Yeah. So what, what I called you about was last time I was talked the to you. The Geminids. I'm sorry. The, uh, the Geminids. Yeah, yeah. Go okay, ahead. Yeah. The last time I talked to you, I was talking about the weather along the uh, eclipse path. Yes. And I, I found a map for you. Oh. Uh, that shows the. Because uh, we don't want cloud cover. We don't want the thing that kept you from seeing the Geminids this week. We definitely don't want yeah. in two years when we go see the uh, solar eclipse. And you were telling me Niagara Falls might not be as good as Austin, Texas this, uh, this time. Yeah, go to um, a website called eclipsofile.com <laughs> slash 2024TSE. And it has a series of maps on there that take uh, about 20 years worth of data and average them down and ah. show you a median, a median cloud amount for ah. the United States along that uh, eclipse path. Well, isn't that cool? Medium cloud fraction. And uh, that, and you want to see the, you want to see a, obviously a blue sky, a median cloud fraction of zero if you can. And so this is the prediction. Yeah. It doesn't look good for Niagara Falls, I must say. Uh, Texas yeah. is 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 not the lowest. The uh, West no, Texas it, is, it's but it, a better. It's better. It's yeah, better, it's green. Better. Uh, chance better chance of getting uh, a clear sky and actually the best place to see it would be to go down to durango or mazatlan or somewhere in mexico and see it because that's gonna that's blue that's yeah. the that's the most likely clear skies i went to mazatlan in 91 to see that total eclipse and it was socked in at mazatlan <sighs> see and we, we had to convince the the ship the guy the captain of the ship to go out into the sea of cortez so we could see that almost Seven minute eclipse. Wow, so cool! But if you want to see, if you want to see what happens with a cloud cover, back in 1970, CBS News was in Valdosta, Georgia, for that eclipse. Yeah, and if you uh, search YouTube for 1970 total solar eclipse or CBS total solar eclipse, you'll see that. And along about 18 minutes in that video. Um, the cloud cover over that uh, college just gets black. Oh, well, eclipsophile.com is the website. We'll talk to you in April 2024. Rod Pyle, Space Guy, next. Rod was dressed for the occasion, but he's now stripped down to his Hawaiian shirt. Yeah, <laughs> had to give up on the hat. It was just too ungainly. Hey, and thank you, thank you for this too. By the way, oh yeah, I had you ever seen see it before? It. No. So this was one of the first shuttle documentaries done by one of the co-inventors of IMAX, a wonderful guy named Graham Ferguson, who I I only knew briefly, but um, it's uh, narrated by Walter Cronkite. It's an '84, so it was pre-Challenger, so it's very rah rah. The shuttle can do anything, yeah, so yeah, that's it fine. feels a little dated. But it is just wonderfully produced. Real, I don't know if you call it tearjerker, but it really plucks at your heartstrings. I will, uh, I'm going to watch it on our, um, I left it here so I could remember, because I knew if I took it home, I wouldn't be able to remember to show you. <laughs> but I will, uh, I wish I could see it in IMAX, but uh, I'll play yeah. it on our uh, LG OLED. It'll look pretty good. That's the only wish TV in the house with a DVD player. Oh, you're right. I, and I wish they had done it in Blu-ray, but it's just, it's so old now. Yeah, you know, it's not current 80, inventory. Yeah, they weren't doing that in the 80s. But it was lucky yeah, to find that. Yeah. But it really is cool. uh, wonderfully done, well scored. Thank you. It's very generous. So, and thank course. you for the song. Oh, you bet. Oh, man. that's You weren't getting out of here unscathed today. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, you know, I was, my <laughs> biggest fear was Lisa. I didn't expect it coming from you. I uh, yeah, well, it's not her fault, okay? <laughs> now, I, that was worrying me. Well, I will uh, I will put that song uh, somewhere. I'll put it on our uh, website or something. I, oh, I wonder what's I, waiting for you. You get home today. Oh, God, I don't even know. <laughs>
probably a she, choir on the front lawn or she something. She says she's taking me away after Christmas to celebrate our the retirement. So Isn't that great? Yeah, we'll do something fun. I don't know what. But yeah. She said, just pack your bathing suit. That's all you're going to need. I said, that sounds good to me. That sounds tropical. Sounds okay, good. good. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Looking I'm thinking, you know, Mazatlan or Hawaii, but yeah. So did you see the Geminids? I didn't. It was cloudy here, and uh, I had I had sat out in a hot tub in the desert for the Perseids, and I thought, you know, I don't need to be you out. See one meteor degrees. shower. You see you know, well, them. Well, no, I see. Here's the thing: in 1966, the Leonids. I think we've talked about this. It was a record year, uh, and I happened to be out out back watching the sky that night in Pasadena. And it was famous because it was like God just dumped a salt shaker in the atmosphere. I mean, there was thousands of wow. them in the hour. Wow. It was terrifying and amazing at the same time. So I love meteor showers, but they just don't live up to that, right? Yeah. I watch yeah. them on TV. It's good enough for me. <laughs> There's a, no, always a you YouTube gotta... video of a meteor shower. Yeah, that's true. It condenses the time a bit. I'm just it? impatient. All right. Yeah. Remember, I'm going to play the song uh, this time. Okay. Yep. I got a special uh, Rod a pile. Okay. Just for Rod. Standing by. Just for Rod to celebrate this special day. Launch hold. <laughs> what? Are, is there a launch today? Nah, I'm just mouthing off. Making noise. Just making noise yeah. as usual. That's me. My clock broke. <laughs> Just uh -oh. in time for me to give it to Rich tomorrow. <laughs> Do you mind if I uh, pitch the no. holiday special podcast? No, no, no. Mind, okay. you must. Okay. Yes. Because we got a really great guest. I'm a Lutka man. I Lutka man is you. Do you like your Lutkas, Rod? Are you a Lutka fan? <laughs> Rod Pyle is here, author of Space 2.0, editor-in-chief of Ad Astra magazine, uh, the space.nss.org, National Space Society publication. He joins us every week to talk about space. And I want to thank you, before we do go any farther, I want to thank you for this IMAX DVD that you gave me. The Dream is Alive, Walter Cronkite narrating a history of the space shuttle. You bet. Cool. I haven't listened to it yet, but I or watched it yet, but I will. And it will help me good get my, uh, my my Cronkite down. So that's good, too. <laughs> that's good, too. Rod yeah, uh, is cool. the newest uh, addition to our uh, Tech Guy team. Um, so, yeah. uh, you know, we don't have long memories together, but he does do a wonderful podcast for us. So we're going to continue to work together called This Week in Space. Uh, and in fact, you have a holiday special coming up. Yes, we do. We have an Apollo 8 holiday special and we were lucky to get Apollo flight director Jerry Griffin. Oh, wow. For an interview for about a half hour of that. And then towards the end, we got an Air Force colonel to come on and talk about uh, NORAD Santa Tracker. Well, maybe that one can be your That's first cool. uh, all video uh, this week in space because we'd like to move that from audio only to video. You're graduating. You could put on your big boy pants. <laughs> Any pants at all would actually be welcome. And uh, and we will turn on the video. Maybe that'd be a good time to turn that video on. It's for that special. That's exciting. Leo, all, all my pants are big boy pants, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. Oh, my uh, gosh. When will that be? Is that the, this this week? Friday? The 23rd. The 23rd. Yeah, yeah 23rd. Friday's episode. Yeah. All right, good. So that one was Twit, a lot of fun. TWIT.TV slash TWIS. Yes, sir. Now, what is going on in the world of space, Mr. Pyle? Well, you know, we had a big headline towards the end of the week that has kind of receded a bit. But uh, on the 14th, the Soyuz capsule, which is docked to the ISS along with um, one of SpaceX's Crew Dragons, sprung a leak. And so for the next 18 hours, there was this spray of ice particles coming out the side, which basically emptied out their cooling system. And, you know, this is uh, the Soyuz had been reliable for decades. And then over the last five to seven years, it's it's been having a series of problems. 
this one's one of the worst because they rely on that to get the Russian astronauts home and they rely on Crew Dragon to get the American astronauts home. And neither one of those is big enough to bring back all seven people that are up there. So if they have a problem and assuming that thing won't be functional to come back, which it looks like it's probably not, there could be some people stuck up there for a while until we get something up there in a hurry. So the Russians are talking about this amongst themselves. They're going to have a meeting at the end of December. I don't know why they're waiting that long to decide whether they should rush their next Soyuz, which is supposed to go up in March. And, you know, given the track record, it might be a little risky to do that. Or NASA could always turn to uh, SpaceX and say, how soon can you have something ready to go? And there's, You know, there's probably contingency planning going on of how many extra astronauts can we stick in the crew dragon if we have them lying on the floor? How dangerous is that for their backs when they splash (laughs) down? You know, it's scary stuff. But, you know, the space station is basically a big metal room surrounded by explosives, space capsules that surround it. And if something were to go wrong, a meteorite hit or a fire or something like that, they can retreat to some part of it that they can lock down, but you know, stuff can happen. And we saw that with the Russian mirror station yeah. decades ago. Yeah. What was that? It was leaking uh, something. It was, uh, looked like stars coming out of it. What was it? Yeah, it was, it was a uh, coolant system, but of course the second it, it uh, goes into space, it turns into ice particles. So that's what we were seeing, but it was, I mean, that was a pretty dramatic show. It looked like a cheesy visual effect from a science fiction movie. Um, so yeah, very, very concerning. Uh, And NASA actually, did did that end up, uh, breaking anything? Well, it, it emptied out the cooling system, which they have to have functional to reenter. Yeah, it's too hot otherwise. Right. Right. So So for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, they thought, well, can we fix it? Probably not. Um, so there's a lot of chit chat going back and forth. NASA says one thing, Roscosmos says another, but the bottom line is, it's probably not guessing we're guessing it's probably not fixable in on on site and uh, that presents another problem which is they got to get that thing out of there so they got to uncouple it and then force it to deorbit and burn up good not Lord. good yeah yeah. It, yeah are they blaming uh, an american astronaut for drilling a not hole not yet in it? <laughs> I, I knew yeah it's like oh uh, some hysterical american <laughs> astronaut wanted to get home because they'd have to go outside to do that you know they're suggesting a me- micrometeoroid strike uh, you know it's possible but they've had some workmanship errors going on with both the capsule and their rockets so you know it's hard to say so there's no immediate danger you know unless if that thing starts to heat up while it's sitting there they could have shorts and, and problems and, and hmm. hopefully not, but I suppose potentially an explosion. But if they, you know, if they saw that temperature escalating rapidly, they just decouple the thing and send it on its way. We but, just um, forget. It's, it, it, it's so it's amazing touchy up there, man. It's so amazing. The safety record is so good. We forget how incredibly dangerous this stuff is yeah. and how thin a layer protecting uh, the people inside from the outside uh that is and uh, you know it's it's a very amazing thing that people do uh very brave it is and, and those spacecraft are pretty lightly built you know they look big and sturdy but right. when you when you get close to them you start knocking on them with your knuckles steel it's uh it's got to be thinner it's, and lighter than that it's thin aluminum yeah. yeah and um let's face it it's they're spam in a can as <laughs> as john glenn once as said. was famously said <laughs> yeah um <laughs> So uh, one of the things they're going to have to do, the Russian engineers are suggesting that they maneuver the space station to keep that thing in the shade so it doesn't heat up when oh, it's on the sun. That's why you need to cool it, right? The sun heats it up quite a bit. Yeah. Oh, big time, like yeah. 250 degrees Fahrenheit yeah. plus, you know. So there's a lot of solutions in, in under consideration, but uh, I think at this point it's kind of a wait and see thing. But it's kind of scary. Hmm. Yeah. How many people are up there right now? Seven. And some Russians, some Americans. Yeah. And we're back to the swaps. You know, here in the middle of the Ukraine war, we're still, we just finished an agreement to do astronaut swaps again. So an American astronaut flew up on the last Soyuz and was supposed to fly back in it. Uh, But apparently that's not going to happen. So, you know, it's good that relations are still solid with them during this time of intense political, geopolitical pressure. But you know, if they can't provide safe spacecraft, this is kind of worrisome. And, you know, this there was a time years ago when people were afraid this would be the case of SpaceX. You know, the, the old old guard aerospace industry was saying, oh, they can't do it. It won't be safe. You better look out. And 
you know, look at their record. It's so are we going to, do we have to do an emergency uh, evacuation, stack them up like sardines in the vehicle? Or no. is that just, a, that's a contingency. Yeah, that's if something were to go wrong on the station. I mean, at this point, we still have just enough sort of, capability to get them out. Yeah, it'll just okay. jigger around the crew rotations a bit. And people have had to stay longer on there before. So this isn't unprecedented, you know, for right. one reason or another, you know, launch delay or something. People have had to stay over their allotted mission time on the space station. Is Commander Kelly the still the record holder for that? I don't think so. I think we I'm have a new, a new record actually. Holder. Yeah. He was there and a it, year. Yeah, right. and the records are kind of weird because it's like, you know, a year, one long spread is one thing, and then there's other people that go up for six months no, and no, no. seven months. Yeah, and, no. If you yeah. come home and you go back, I don't count that. I mean, none. Oh, geez, not tough guy. Beginning to end, the whole amount of time. That's what I care about. That's how you set a record. And you'll notice now, you know, he didn't wear glasses all the time before he went up. That's one of the things that happens in your eyeballs get messed up. Yeah. If you're a guy. It doesn't seem to affect women. It only affects men, which is weird because they thought it was intracranial pressure. But they're saying, well, you know, men's eyes and women's eyes are structured kind of the same. So what is this? Wow. So they don't really know. It's a mystery. It's very weird. It's a and mystery. by the way, yes. per your earlier uh, stroll down memory lane for cameras, I started out with a Canon F1 in 1973. Then I switched over to Nikon in the 90s. And then my first digital camera was a D70, just like you. Yeah. Yeah, I think I have Loved that it. D70 somewhere still. They're Rod like Pyle, brick. it's been a pleasure working with you. We'll see you on the new show, space.nss.org. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Jason Heiner, Larry Maggot, and Mike Elgin on Twitter. Thank you, Mr. Pyle, for that wonderful song. I just tooted it. Thank you. Are you on the uh, Mastodon? I, I signed up, but I haven't really taught myself how to use it yet. I'm ashamed to say because <laughs> it's That's a little okay. different. But I did, and I'm old I did, enough that it's like, oh, the interface is different. I, I did toot this. Oh, uh, look what Rod Pa commissioned for me. So there's the whole thing. Is that an AI rendering of you? Yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? Looks just you, like you me. You look very her heroic. Yeah. I know it's cute. I, know. <laughs> I post. I have a. I have a 200 of those, and I just uh, I go through different Aww. ones and so forth. I did, okay. Mike B. I gave my uh, old camera equipment to uh, to Salt Hank, and that's uh, how he got his start. He's with his. Oh. He was using my all my Canon, all my Canon stuff, my five D Mark IV, uh, about fifteen thousand dollars worth of lenses. Still uses it. Yep. How much? <laughs> A lot. <laughs> fifteen thousand, <laughs> like that. I had the complete set. Yes. Wow. They See, that's why I went L with Nikon lenses, too. They were good lenses. Oh my God! See, yeah. where I went with Nikon was you could. You know, you could retrofit those things forever. So right. anything will use. F well, the nice thing now on the mirrorless is uh, because the for some reason, because the sensor is so close to the surface there, it's easy to have adapters. So you can really on any oh. mirrorless use a variety of lenses. I kind of wish I'd saved some of those really fancy lenses that I gave. Get Hank, him back. But, well, no, uh, you know what? Kid, you know? Well, I could, but honestly, uh, he's using them for uh, some. He's doing really well. So I actually kind of feel happy about that yeah but you know that that six millimeter l five thousand dollar lens you gave oh, him hey. probably isn't part of his I, podcast i kept my you know? best lens which is a leica i kept so i'm oh, you have leica stuff too i have a i have the oh, best yeah. it was at the time they said the best lens ever made and like a 50 millimeter and you had to have it <laughs> of course you know what's funny <laughs> is I, I put it in the shopping cart i wasn't yeah. gonna buy it because it was so expensive you bought it new i accidentally Oh. <laughs> bought it and i didn't right. realize it wait until, air quotes no no i did i thought i just yeah. put it in the shopping cart but i didn't but somehow it arrived and i thought oh well <clears throat> i own it now and how much was that it was eight if i may ask it was about eight thousand hey lisa did you hear that oh okay. she knows she uses yeah. it she loves it in fact the best picture the one of the first pictures i took with it was a beautiful image of her and her son in the hot tub, which she oh. cherishes. It's uh, says he was a uh, you know that was very know, was ta eleven or twelve. Tactically cagey of you. Oh, well, I'll show you the picture. Let me see if I can find it. It was. Well, but a how smart picture. is that? Yeah. It's like oh, oh Lisa, it's expensive, this, but look this at this picture. So I took, good. Honey. Well, right. we have a good relationship. We have our own money. I don't have to beg her, and she doesn't have to beg me. And she, she likes it that way because she uh, has a thing for uh, jewelry. So, ah, okay. So it's fine. It all works out. It all works out. Yeah, no, my Leica 
all my best pictures, many of my best pictures were are shot with that lens. It's an amazing lens. Mm. Yeah, really, really. Lovely. Never had a Leica. Had a lot of cameras. About twenty five cameras, but I never had a Leica. Q2, which is a great little point and shoot. Twenty eight was fixed lens, twenty eight millimeter. Yeah, yeah, a little really rangefinder, like right? Yeah, it's really. It's not a rangefinder. No, it's a no, no, and because uh, I've tried the rangefinders, I can't use them. I do not. Really? I can't. They're just too hard to use. Just hard to line up? I can't. Yeah. It takes too long to focus. Hmm. So, um, no, this is a digital with a very fast autofocus. Actually. Oh, it's, okay. It's a newer one. Yeah, yeah, it's the Q2. Yeah, no. I do have a Leica M1 film camera that I bought that's as old as yeah. I am. Yeah. Uh, a long time ago. That was a, that's a wonderful People thing. still swear, sign, but they're yeah, kind of a pain in the yeah. butt. And using film it's anymore, pain. you know, I know, it is. Chris Marquardt talked me into it. I regret it. <laughs> All right, Rod. We'll talk soon. Take care. Take care. Thanks for everything. It's been You're great. You're welcome. You're welcome. What are you talking about? I got another three hours, don't I? No? <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Such a pleasure being your tech guy for the last 19 years. What a privilege it has been. I mean, I am not insensible to that. When I first started working in radio at the age of 20 back in 1976. I, I dreamed someday of having a nationally syndicated radio show. That's the that's the height, right? That's the peak. You can't get any better than that. Uh, I was very fortunate back in 2004. I was working on tech TV, doing a TV show for the cable channel. Cable channel was starting to fall apart. We knew it was for sale, and I was a little worried about my future. I had two small kids, nine and 11, and the family to support. And I was a little nervous about what was, what was happening at tech TV. And uh, a woman uh, who is to this day, still a good friend and a mentor, Robin Bertolucci. Uh, I knew her at uh, KGO in San Francisco. And then she was at KOA in Denver and she was a program director at KFI. She said, we need a tech guy. <laughs> Our tech guy is, is moving across town to another station, Jeff Levy. Uh, and uh, she said, would you like to uh, do a weekend radio show for us? It didn't. I don't think I hesitated. I'll have to ask Robin. I don't think I hesitated. I think I jumped at the, uh, at the chance, and said, "Well, yeah, sure." This was uh, January two thousand four. For a while, I was doing five days a week on TV and two days a week on the radio. Still, the best fun I've ever had. We went to CES, covered that live in, in the third show, <laughs> the third and fourth show. Uh, a few years in, uh, I think. I think I was trying to quit, as I remember. As I remember saying, "Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I don't want to lose my weekends anymore." And I think Robin said to me, uh, "Well, what if I could talk Premier, our you know part of our company, iHeart? If I wonder if we, if I could talk them into syndicating it, would you be interested?" Well, now that's uh, that's catnip to a radio host. I said, "Well, yeah, <laughs> I guess I would." She did. Craig Kitchen, who was running Premier at the time, uh, we talked him into it. Actually, it was thanks to uh, the sponsors on the KFI radio show, uh, chiefly the go-to uh, folks, go-to meeting, uh, go-to, uh, what was the other go-to? I can't remember. Uh, go to my PC. Uh, and, the, and, and Michael Guarnieri, who was running their marketing effort, we went to lunch and Michael said, all right, we're in. We'll, we'll buy ads on your new national syndicated show. And that was all it took. Uh, we started that show in 2007. Stayed the tech guy. It was originally the tech guy on KFI. See, it rhymes. But stayed the tech guy. And it's been a, ever since a wonderful journey, I think. Robin, who's continued to be a mentor and support uh, through all of this. Bill Handel, also at KFI, who was very generous and kind when I arrived. Uh, took me to lunch and said, Leo, <laughs> how can I use the internet to find porn? No, he didn't say that. And <laughs> and thanks especially to Julie Talbot, who's of course uh, the current uh, person in charge, CEO of uh, the Premier Radio Networks, my syndicator. Uh, it has been a wonderful 19 years. We loved doing this and uh, I will continue to do podcasting, but my heart will forever be in radio. Thanks to Professor Laura. You are a wonderful musical director. You do a, a fantastic job. And I know you're going to continue on with Rich DeMuro and do an even better job for him. He's not going to ask you to play the old songs from 1954 or anything like that. He'll have nice, fresh, current music. Thanks to Kim Schaffer. 
She's been answering the phones. Kim, you've been a wonderful person to work with, and uh, I know you and Rich will get along just fine. Uh, can I ask you, though, on his first show, if you can have Chris from Miami call <laughs> and uh, Micah from Maine. I'm going to have them all. And <laughs> Torture you, him. you, yeah, have them all call him, and if if there's any printer calls, put those right at the front of the line. Would you do that I'm for me? I'm gonna do that, and I'll get fired day one. <laughs> no, no, you be nice to Rich. Rich is a great guy. Rich on Tech will be taking over from KTLA. Rich Demuro, he filled in for me for many many times over the past few years, uh, and so he's he knows the show. He's familiar with it. Uh, and he'll be a great tech guy for you starting January 7th. Well, I have time to take a few more calls before we have to turn the lights out in the studio here and, and, and lock it up and head for home. Let's go to Henry on the line from Prescott Valley, Arizona. Hello, Henry. How you doing there, Leo? I am well. How are you? I didn't appear in the uh, obituaries this morning, so I'm fine. <laughs> you get to a certain age, Henry, when you start to read those, don't you? And you tell me if you do this, because I do. I always look at how old they were when they passed. Always, always. <laughs> to, to know, do I have some more time? <laughs> well, Henry, you and I are both here. What can I do for you? Well, I just uh, wanted to say I'm sorry that you're leaving the radio, but uh, for the past five years I've been streaming your show anyway, so I know how to do it. And uh, That's the magic of the Internet. Sundays. Yeah. Yeah, well, there'll be one fewer shows. Uh, Rich is going to take Saturdays. Uh -huh. I'm going to take Sundays. Mine will be internet only, but I hope people could figure out how to listen. You just go to techguylabs.com. It's right there. And well, I started with you on KFI uh, the first day you were on. Wow. And I've been there all the time, and uh, I've called you countless times before. I'm, I'm the guy who goes to... Uh, the folk music gathering with the uh, oh Rocky, yeah uh, air show guy every oh year. yeah now I know who you are Henry yeah so you talked to Heather Hammond back in the day and of course Heather has been oh yeah a great oh, uh, help as well through the show yeah we had there's so many people I can't you know Michael Cozio and Big Pee Wee and all the all the board ops and so forth there've been so many people I'm sure I'm gonna you miss can't some. remember everybody I can't <laughs> remember anybody I just, just if I didn't have it written down I'd be uh, I'd be out of luck. But I do remember you, Henry, uh, and I appreciate uh, the fact that you've been here all this time. Now, you are you a ham? Are you an amateur radio guy? No, not yet, but I am going to be. I uh, first uh, wanted to be a want, got the uh, ham bug. Oh, good. In 1956, <laughs> when I read the Hardy Boys book, <laughs> The Short Wave Mystery. <laughs> Well, you've been waiting a long time. I think now, 66 years later, it might be a good idea for you. To t Here's where I would suggest yeah. starting, which is my good friend Gordon West, who is my Elmer. They call the your your elder uh, ham operator who gets you gets you in the game is your Elmer. Gordon was my Elmer. GordonWestRadioSchool.com. He still does it. He's wonderful. His books are the best way to prepare for the courses, but he also has lots of a whole resource center of products. Uh, for instance, he recommended, and I would recommend to you to start with a handy talkie because they're very easy to get started with. Uh, and you don't need a big old rig, and what you don't also don't need is a big old antenna. And uh, uh -huh. and these little handy talkies, you're just like they're just like walkie talkies, except they're you need a license to operate them. They're ham radio, and he has a whole uh -huh. page on on uh, the walkie-talkies and uh, where to get them from so you don't have to program them yourself and so forth. Uh, I highly would highly recommend those. There are a number of very good manufacturers. I have a Kenwood, but I have to say uh, uh, nowadays it's the Chinese manufacturers who are kind of taking over, as they are with everything else, taking over the uh, ham radio um, hardware market. Um, uh -huh. But, uh, you know... I. I have some strong opinions on that, uh, but go to, go to Gordon. He's the expert. He was my teacher. He will help you, and it's about time. You started all those years ago. You got the Hardy Boys shortwave radio book. Maybe it's a good time. That kind of nice way to end this show is to talk about the amateur radio operators who have been good friends like Bob Heil and Gordon West. We did a ham show for them for many years, a podcast called Ham Nation that was a lot of fun. So... Uh, Oh, is it time to say hey, hey, hey? 
Goodbye. Is it? Is it that time? I hear the music coming up behind me. Laura, what are you going to do without me to tease? <laughs> you have to start teasing. Start teasing Rich. He's he's a good guy. I don't think he'll give you a hard time. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't know. I'm not crying. You're crying. Thank you for letting me be your tech guy for 19 years. Have a great geek week and year and life. And happy holidays, everybody. Goodbye. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech. And you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on. And, of course... The big show every Sunday afternoon this week in tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.